This show is very meta. And I say that so that I have an excuse if things break. <laughs> it's not like showing software, which I've done thousands of times and it's far easier than doing a live show about live gear, using that live gear to use to do that live show. So I have multiple ATEMs here feeding into each other. I have all kinds of presets that undoubtedly some of them are going to break and mess up and throw the wrong thing on screen. But with any luck, with any luck, things will go reasonably well to plan. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to a Blackmagic webinar on the ATEM. This is a four hour long session. We are doing a lot in these four hours. We will be taking a break 15 minutes right around the middle-ish. I'm, I'm going to say around noon Pacific time. Don't know exactly, but about halfway through um, when I either get so hungry I can no longer stand or, um, or just decide I need a break, then we'll do that. We'll take a short break. There'll be a timer on the screen. You can run off and do your thing and come back in the appropriate time. Um, if you want to watch the show live in 4K, we are simultaneously streaming this to that URL on your screen, photojustof.com slash ATEM. That'll redirect you to the YouTube channel where it is streaming in 4K. It is probably a little bit delayed from what you're seeing in Zoom, so it'll be a little bit of a time shift in there, but you'll be able to see it in higher resolution, which may not matter so much for the video here, but when we get into looking at things on screen, you might appreciate that slightly higher resolution. So this is the ATEM Workshop. I'm Photo Joseph. I am at Photo Joseph absolutely everywhere. Always appreciate the likes and the follows, Twitter, Instagram, but most importantly, on YouTube, where I do all kinds of stuff on all things live streaming, video production, photography a bit less these days. It's mostly video these days, but Photo Joseph on YouTube. And I do have a whole series of ATEM videos on there. They're called my um, ATEM mini tips, and you uh, hopefully can enjoy those to learn lots more little things. We're obviously not gonna go super deep into everything today, but we are going to go as deep as we can in the time that we have. Also joining us today is Mr. Gary Adams from Black Magic. That email address you see on the screen right now if you are watching this live is for you to contact him after the event if you desperately need help with something. He is the man to know all the answers. If you are not watching this live, then you won't see his email address because I will obscure it so that he doesn't get emails from thousands of people. But if you are here live, then that is one of the benefits. You get his email address, you can reach out to Gary. So here's the format for today. Let's run through the list. Uh, first of all, asking questions in the Zoom Q&A. So you've got the Zoom Q&A, there's a Zoom chat. I mean, you can kind of use both, but the chat's really for talking about yourselves, the Zoom q and so you can ask questions. Gary may well respond to your question directly there. He may tell you that he's gonna ask me that question live. He may aggregate questions to kind of combine multiple similar questions and ask me live. That's up to Gary, totally out of my control. That's on him. So if you got any questions, drop them in there. He will do his best. The YouTube chat is closed, at least it should be if I did that properly. So you shouldn't be talking to each other um, or asking Gary questions in there because he is not monitoring that. And it's YouTube, so it could collapse at any moment as we all know. Uh, we will be taking a quick lunch break around noon, as I said earlier. So there will be a countdown timer on screen so you'll know how much time is left and I'll do my best to get back before that timer runs out. So the agenda for today, here's what we're running through. So first of all, an introduction to the ATEM, basically what it is, and explaining the different models so you understand the differences between the different models that you have, because they range in price from $300 to $10,000. You probably wanna figure out which one you might need if you haven't already purchased one. We're going to dive kind of top to bottom on the ATEM. So we're gonna go into the ATEM settings, we're gonna go through switching basics, what preview and program means and what the difference is and so on. We are going to talk about transitions, you know, cross dissolve wipes, that sort of things, how to customize those, how to set those up. We're going to go through the upstream and downstream keys. In this, we're gonna cover all the different types of keys, so your Luma, Chroma, Pattern, and DVE keys. I have a fun little demo all set up for the Chroma key, so, you know, Cross all your fingers and toes that that all goes together as planned because <laughs> it's live and you never know what's going to happen. We will talk about super source. We're actually going to end up talking about that a bit during the upstream downstream part, but we will dive deep, uh, deep ish into super source itself. We will talk about the media player. We will talk about the audio control, and that is going to uh, be focusing largely on the mini lineup, but we'll see what kind of audio control we have in there and a camera control. So we're gonna take a look at the camera so you can see on the wide shot, which if I go to the wide shot here, there we go. We actually have two cameras set up here, two Blackmagic uh, pocket cinema cameras that are feeding into the ATEM. I'll take you through a tour of the whole rig here in a moment, but that is, um, that is all there. So we'll take a look at how that control works. And what's next uh, and last is macros. All right, macros, super important way to control your system. 
Now, if you have attended one of these webinars before, the last time I did this, last couple times I did this, it was over two days. We had more time. So if you're watching this, um, hoping for a kind of a repeat of some of the stuff we did on the last half, the second day last time, that is not here. We're not doing the, uh, we're not going to do the live, you know, shooting to an ATEM, uh, sorry, shooting to the Black Magic and copying over and syncing up. We don't have time for that. We're not going to talk about all the external hardware that goes into a live production or can go into live production. All of that is not going to be on today's agenda uh, because we only have the one day this time. But if you have questions about that, you can catch up by watching older ATEM webinars. These are all on my YouTube channel. Or, of course, you can post questions on YouTube on any ATEM video afterwards, and I'll do my best to answer you. All right, so with that said, let's go to the full slide split and see if I get this right. Go up to basic first question, what is an ATEM anyway? So let's just start at the very top. What is an ATEM? The name I, people ask, and it is pronounced ATEM, not ATEM or A-T-E-M. I hear those a lot, but it's just ATEM. Apparently, the history is like some Greek god name or something. There's some weird connection like that. It doesn't actually stand for anything, so don't break your brain trying to figure out what it stands for. But what is an ATEM? An ATEM is, at its core, a video switcher. That's it, right? If you just look at its most basic functionality, multiple cameras in, how many can go in? Well, it depends on the hardware you have, and then out. How many programs out? You're going to send out a program. That's what goes out to the audience. You are mixing your, your video. You're switching between cameras, doing overlays, doing graphics, doing picture-in-picture, -picture, split screens, all that stuff. But you're taking all those video inputs, graphic inputs, audio inputs, mixing them together to send out a program. That is effectively at its core what an ATEM is. That's, that's really all there is to it. There's so much more in the nuances, but that is effectively what it does. And what you do with that program out is up to you. That can be simply used as a webcam for doing a fancy Zoom call. It can be live streaming to a YouTube video. It can be projecting on a huge screen at a house of worship or a concert or any kind of live event. It can be any number. It can be used for broadcast, full-on broadcast to broadcast TV. Although I guess, you know, I say that like that's a big deal. Broadcast TV is kind of boring these days, isn't it? It's all online. So you have, that's the, the core at its core what it is. Bring a bunch of cameras and other stuff in and spit out a signal for the audience to see. So let's talk about the ATEM models. Go back to my slides here. Let's talk about the different ATEM models and see what the current lineup is. So here's the current lineup of the minis. So you have your ATEM mini, ATEM mini pro, ATEM mini extreme. And there's actually more than this. I think these just aren't on this page. And then you've got your SDI versions of these. So these are these ones here. I'm going to go to an overhead view. Here we go. This is the ATEM Mini lineup. This is one of the extreme models. This is the extreme ISO. And over here, I've got this one not plugged in. This is the also the ATEM Mini Pro ISO, but the standard size, not the extreme size. So you can see it's about kind of half the physical size. This one has four inputs, while the extreme has eight inputs on it. And the this lineup of the ATEM switchers are all HDMI in. Let's go to my overhead again. See HDMI in. You can see those HDMI ports on there. Um, but you'll see if we go back to the slides that there is a brand new lineup of these that are the SDI versions. So identical hardware, identical functionality, except that there's a whole set that is um, SDI input instead of HDMI input. So what is the difference there? Most consumer cameras that you buy are going to have an HDMI out, which is why this consumer grade of the A10 minis had HDMI in. So HDMI, you all know what an HDMI port is. You look at the side of your camera, it might have a mini port, it might have a full size port. That's the same thing that you plug into your TV that you use to connect your Apple TV or your Roku or whatever into your television. That's HDMI. It carries video, it carries audio, and it's two-way communication, which is really important because that allows us to control the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras from the A10 Mini. SDI, on the other hand, is it considered a more professional, more broadcast level uh, cable. It carries your video and audio as well. However, it's a single way communication, so you can't send commands back to the camera over an SDI cable. SDI cables are more robust. You can run them for much longer lengths without any signal degradation, and they are considered more of a broadcast standard. So when you get into the bigger ATEMs, they're all SDI, but now as you see on your screen, there is a lineup of the ATEM minis that are also SDI. So that's pretty cool. The difference between these, between the, the mini, the forget about the extreme for a second, so you got your mini, your mini pro, and your mini pro ISO. 
you've basically got at the base level, the mini mini, which looks exactly like this, is that it just does your switching and output over program, but it cannot live stream. So basically you would use that one if all you're interested in doing is live switching multiple cameras for a Zoom call or to pipe into OBS or something like that on your computer. The next level up, the ATEM Mini Pro, includes a live streaming encoder. That means you plug this into your network and you can now choose to live stream to YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, whatever, directly from the hardware. So you don't need to have a computer that handles the live streaming on top of that. Then you add the ISO to the name and what ISO does is it records all of the ISO streams. So ISO means basically isolated. So if you have four cameras coming into your switcher and you are recording your show, not only do you get the program, the mixed show, but you also get all four individual ISO streams. So when you take that hard drive, you just plug in an SSD drive, and you take that hard drive and plug it into your computer, you will see all four of those video streams plus the program, plus the audio, Plus, the most exciting part is an XML file that you can import into DaVinci Resolve. And if you're using a different editor, you can convert it. Uh, but you put it, drop it into DaVinci Resolve and you have your whole live program with all the cuts, all the wipes, all the dissolves, all the trends, everything that you did is right there, which you can now re-edit. So you can say, oh, I cut to this camera too soon. Let's adjust that. Oh, I switched to camera one when I should have switched to three. Let's fix that. You can fix all of that in post and then render out a new video to upload later. So it's, it's an extremely powerful way to work. So you can go live and do a live show like you normally would and know that even if you make a mistake, you'll be able to correct that mistake later and re-upload a higher quality version, edit it down, and it's awesome. So that's where the ISO comes in. Then as I said, you've got your mini size and your extreme size. Basic differences there are the number of inputs. There are some other features on the extremes like super source that we'll get into later, which are included in the extremes and not on the smaller ones. Then you've got the next level of the lineup and that is the constellation line. So the constellation line starts with the 1ME, then there's the 2ME, a 4ME, and then the constellation 8K. So this top three up there are effectively the same except that they are they have more inputs and outputs so there's 10 20 and 40 inputs and outputs on those and the and then the 8k will handle up to 8k video and that and i think it has 40 inputs and outputs it's a massive beast of a thing and effectively at its core they are doing the same thing as the minis are bringing in video switching them up as you need um, and then you know outputting your signal but some of the core differences there first of all they are all sdi only there is no hdmi version of those each one of those has what you could describe as a video hub built into it. And what this means is each one of those, for as many inputs as they have, they have the same number of outputs. And those outputs can be any of the inputs. So you can have two or three outputs that are your program. So going to projectors, TVs around the facility, and if you've got like a big concert hall, or again, House of Worship is a great example. You have out to projector, out to TVs out in the hallway, that sort of thing. You can have individual feeds going out to there. Then you can have feeds going up to confidence monitors. So you've got your people on stage, you want them to see uh, their camera, see the program, or see just their camera that's on them. You can have anything that's going in, going out of any of those streams. You have this massive amount of flexibility in those. So that's, there's a bunch more to it, but that is the kind of at its core of the differences. But you actually drop something when you go to those, uh, the Constellation models. You don't have the built-in live streaming encoder, which is a significant thing to understand. When you're working with one of these, these are designed to be used kind of standalone. Everything happens here. Your inputs come in, your output goes out to a confidence monitor so you know what's happening. Your live stream is happening from here, your switching is happening on here. When you're using one of the constellations, you can do the switching. I mean, here's a, a 2ME constellation. You can see it does have buttons on the front of it. So you can switch on there, but it's not really what it's designed for. Those are more designed, the switches are more designed to be uh, for testing. This is designed to be rack mounted. You can see the rack ears on there. You are meant to stick this in a rack and then on a computer or some other hardware console, uh, take control of that software, uh, of that hardware. And then for the actual encoding part of it, you also don't do the encoding from here. For that, you have to have a separate encoder. And that can be done in software or in hardware. There's things like the web presenters, which will allow you to live stream in HD or the web presenter 4K, which I'm actually using right now to stream out to YouTube, will stream out in 4K. So that's the the, um, the main differences there. So that's, that's enough of that. If we go back to the slides real quick, you'll see again that bottom one there. It's, um, well, I said 10,000. It's $11,245 for that Constellation 8K. But that will do 4K of course as well and it is currently the only model that does 4k and then it will of course do all the way up to 8k so that's a it's a big beast all right moving on now let's start diving into the atem itself let's talk about the atem settings 
So we're going to go into some of the preferences, some of the settings in here, just to understand what's in the ATEM software. I'm going to be controlling the ATEM Mini Extreme that you see on my desk right here. This is the one I'm going to be controlling for most of the demo. Uh, there will be times where I'll be using my, my own ATEM that's in the rack, which is an older ATEM. It's called the ATEM 2ME, which is now confusing because that model name needs something else today. But the one that I have is a 4K switcher. So this is an, I mean, it's probably like eight years old now or something, but it is a 4K switcher. And that's what I'm using to actually switch this program that you're watching. Um, but for the controls, we're mostly going to be looking at this little ATEM Mini. So let's go over to my screen. I'll actually start by showing you, um, you can see over here, this is the web presenter that is actually streaming to YouTube right now. So that's kind of kind of fun. But I'll go ahead and close that because we don't need that right now. And we're going to look at the ATEM software. Now, first thing I need to do is switch over to the other ATEM. So this is the ATEM switcher, uh, the this connection switcher. Let me turn my little mouse highlight back on. Uh, let's see, turn Mouse Pro on. There we go. I'll make it easier to see what's going on. And if I set this up properly, huh, of course it's not working now. I should have a way to zoom into this. Let me just set that real quick because it was working yesterday and that will help. Where's the preferences here? Open the preferences. And this is a great little utility, but it keeps forgetting. Maybe it's set to F function. Let me just, let me just do this again. Okay, set that to function. Still not zooming in. Silly thing, we're going to quit and relaunch this because it's very, very useful to have this utility on here, Pro Mouse. And hopefully this time, yay, now it zooms in. Okay, so there we can see that zooming in. Let me close all this junk up here. So this is the ATEM connection service, if you will. This allows me to connect to the different ATEMs. And you can see that I actually have four ATEMs online here in my studio. The ATEM 2ME Production Studio 4K is the model that I'm actually live streaming through right now. There's that constellation. And mostly we're going to be focused on this ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. So I'm going to go ahead and select that one, connect to it. The software switches over so that I'm now connected to that ATEM. So let's start with the settings. Actually, before I even get in there, let me start with a very basic high-level tour of this interface, and then we'll dive into the settings. So you'll see down at the bottom, there are four buttons. There's your switcher, your media, your audio, and your camera. Those are different pages, if you will. So this is where I handle all my switching. This is where I can load up different media. This is where I can control the audio coming in. And this is where I can control the cameras if I have controllable cameras. So if you are using an ATEM Mini, but you do not have Blackmagic cameras, you just have you know any other cameras plugged into it, that page will still be there, you just won't be able to do anything with it. But because we have the Blackmagic cameras, we actually have control over that. So I, I get this question a lot. People say, well, I have this thing hooked up and I'm doing making changes and there's not doing anything. Well, it's because you're not using a Blackmagic camera. That's why. So that's the only cameras that do that. Anyway. All right, so let's go back over here and dive into the settings. There's a couple different places to look at settings. There's this little gear cog down here that brings up a bunch of stuff. There are simple preferences that bring up a few more things. And very importantly, if we go into the connections page and click on ATEM setup, there are additional setup options in here. It's, this is a whole separate app called ATEM setup, but this does do a couple of very important things for your hardware. So we're going to start with this. This little button here will launch into the setup options. And from here, you'll see things like your network control. It also will tell you connect to using USB to adjust the network settings. So if you are if you're connected this to your network and you want to make changes to the network settings, you'll find that you have to plug it in over USB. Temporarily, plug it in over USB, make your network setting changes, unplug it, and then you're good to go again. But, uh, but just so you know, that is often how you have to do it. Incidentally, the ATEM Mini lineup all have what's called a DHCP, like this is not a server, DHCP receiver, router, whatever the term is, but they're DHCP compliant. So you plug these into your network and they should just show up. The Constellation line, at least this one, does not have DHCP in it. So that means that to get it on your network for the first time, you will have to connect it over USB and enter network settings into it. So super important to know if you're used to the minis and you go to the Constellation, you plug it into your network and it just doesn't show up, that's why go USB and off you go. Okay, let's go back to this. So um, from here, you can set up your network settings on there. And there's this very important switching mode in here between cut bus and program preview. When we get into program and preview, we're going to talk about what that actually means. But I want to point it out in here and we'll I'll, I'll do it again because I am actually going to make a switch to this. Um, it's, it's a buried setting change, but you do have to go in here into the setup app to make this change, just so you know. 
Anyway, let's see here. There's some other important stuff like picture-in-picture -picture keyer. Do you want it to stay on with transition or drop with transition? Uh, with transition. So this would effectively mean, and again, this will make more sense when you see picture-in-picture, -picture, but if you're using just the hardware buttons to, in, to load a picture-in-picture, as you switch to another angle, do you want that picture in picture to stay up or do you want it to drop away as you switch angles? This is a universal setting that you can set here in the settings. There's a couple other things here. We don't need to dive into each one of these and explain them all, but this is all, you, you do have some important settings here, including even the button brightness. So if you want to adjust the button brightness there, so I'm dragging the slider. Now let's go to the overhead view and you can see that I can adjust the brightness of those buttons on there. Um, so if you're working with this in a dark room, that can be very handy to have access to. All right. I'm just going to cancel this. And then from this page, you if you have multiple ATEMs on your network or, or streaming bridges, those all show up in here as well. Incidentally, you can see streaming bridge number two. This is how Gary's signal is coming in. He is currently streaming to me from another part of the country. And um, the, all the ATEMs are accessible within here. So there they all are. All right, let's go back into the one I actually want to work with. And I can click this button here to launch over to the ATEM software control, or as you saw before, I could connect to it from here. That's that first page of settings. Let's take a quick look at the preferences. And actually, there's really not really anything in here we need to worry about. This all gets into some pretty advanced stuff that is not important for your starting point, so we're just going to skip that. But we are going to dive into this gear menu because this is important. First thing you want to do once you get your switcher online is go into the general setup. So this is the settings. Go into the general settings and set your video standard. By default, when you buy it, it is probably going to be at 1080p 24 which is lovely if you want to stream at 24p, you want to have that cinema frame rate, uh, but odds are your camera is not set to do that. Odds are your camera is set to either 2997 if you're in, the, in North America, or it's set to 25 frames if you're outside of North America. So you probably are going to want to change that because if you don't send in the same frame rate as your switcher is set to, then they have to be converted. And now this is one of the most beautiful things about the ATEM Mini lineup and now the Constellation as well. Every input has a scaler, so it will automatically change it into the correct frame rate, but you will get a better quality signal if you don't have to convert it. So if you are sending 2997 and streaming 2997, yay. If you are sending 2997 and streaming 24, you're gonna see a little jumps in there because things have to happen with the frames. Frames have to get dropped, things have to get blended. It's just, it's not gonna be as pretty. So match, match, match for the best quality signal. And this is where you set that default. You have to go in here and set your video standard to whatever you want it to be. I'm setting it to 1080p 2997 into this. And incidentally, the simple fact that I'm streaming in 4K, I'm streaming in 4K at 2997, even though this is outputting 1080p, I've got a scaler sitting in between this and the, um, the encode so that I can do things like bring up the multi-view from the ATEM. Of course, we're gonna come back to that later, but I can bring up that multi-view and it's being scaled up from HD. This setup is a bit silly, but you know, that's just me. Anyway, all right, so that is super important. I, just, I cannot emphasize this enough. That is the first place you wanna go and set that. Um, audio settings in here, so you have multiple audio inputs on the hardware. You can choose how those are mapped out, whether mono or stereo. I'm, we don't need to dive into all of these. You can figure a lot of this out as you play with it, but there are important audio settings in here. Also for the mic input levels, um, ah, actually, haha, that would explain why my audio is so low. This was set to the wrong thing, so I had this set to line level input. I've got, for a later demo, I've got a, a little microphone plugged in here. And I was like, man, this is really, really quiet. That's why, because I had the wrong setting in there. So really important, make sure you know where your settings are. So if you're plugging in a microphone, plug in, set it to microphone level. If you're plugging in a mic and it needs power, then you can do this and it will actually deliver a little bit of power to that microphone. Then you get into your multi-view settings. So that is what you just saw on screen. Let me bring this back up again. There we go. This is called the multi-view and what you see on these different panes is controllable through here. So let's go back to this. You can change, so you have four different quadrants to it. Each quadrant can be, uh, let's see here, from this little guy here, I can see whether that quadrant is a single image or a four up image. And then within each one of those little windows, you can choose what you want to see in there. So you want to see camera one and camera two and, and so on and so on through here. Um, you can set it to have your preview and program, which is your kind of standard setting, but you can totally customize this however you want. Really, really useful. You can also turn audio meters on for each, every, uh, each and every output or at least each ones that have audio coming in so you can keep an eye on the audio levels. 
labels, this is another important one. So you look over here at my buttons and you see they don't just say Cam 1, Cam 2, Cam 3. It says 4K, 6K, and iPad, and then Cam 4 through 8 because I don't have anything plugged into those. But this is a name that indicates to me what is on that input. So that is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, so I'll label it 4K, the MP BMPCC 6K, and an iPad. And if you look over here at this window, you have two names, the name and the label. So you have a longer name, which will show up in all the menus, and then you have the label, which is what shows up on the buttons here. Very, very good idea to set this up. That just gives you that ability to know at a glance when you're looking at the software or you're choosing things from the menus what you're dealing with. So highly advise you. And you can set it, you can name it whatever you want. You know, camera left, camera right, close up, wide shot, overhead. Um, you can name it by camera, the 6K, the 4K, whatever. It's up to you, but highly advise naming your cameras. It'll make your life a lot easier when you're dealing with this. Uh, yeah, same thing on output, but you really don't ever change that. And then the media tab, you can rename those if you want to as well. Hyperdex, we're not going to get into Hyperdex today, but uh, just very, very briefly, a Hyperdex is a standalone media player and recorder. And there's a whole series of these from Blackmagic. The Hyperdex can be used to record a show. For example, I'm recording this show on a Hyperdex that I have sitting in my rack. And they can also be used to play back media. So there's going to be a point when Gary comes up on screen, you'll see in the background, there's like a little animated blue wishy thing going in the background. That is actually video playing from another Hyperdex. You can control those Hyperdex from the ATEM, which is Really, really awesome. And I'm going to tell you about this now because we're not going to actually demo it, but just so you understand what you can do with the Hyperdex. Let's say that you're doing a show where you're going to have interstitials, you're going to have ads running, you're going to have animated lower thirds. You have all these things that you've designed and built into the hyper, uh, built into videos that you want to play during your program. Instead of having to go into a deck and find, okay, video number 32, okay, get ready to queue that up. Okay, we're going to hit play here and hit play here at the same time. You don't have to do any of that because you can control the Hyperdex from the ATEM software. You can load it up and choose which video you want to play and play it from there. And you, by using macros, which we'll get to at the very end of the presentation today, you can actually make a single macro that would, for example, bring camera one up on air, hold it for five seconds, fade to the hyperdeck and start playing video number 32, hold for 30 seconds, the duration of your video, and then fade back to camera three. You can do stuff like that with a single touch and queue up the exact right video with the Hyperdeck because of that clean integration. So it's super, super cool. When you do go to set it up, this is where you set it up, your Hyperdeck panel, you enter the IP address of your Hyperdeck and they show up in here. So that's how that works. And then remote, we don't need to deal with that. So there's your basic setting. So that is at its core, your most important getting started before you start messing around with your ATEM, just get this thing set up. I, you know, there used to be a time where the general wisdom was any app, any hardware, anything you get, before you start messing around with it, go into the settings, the preferences. Go in and look and see what's there. You'll learn a lot about that service, that app, whatever. You'll learn a lot about it and get things set up the way you want. I think these days people just forget about that and they just kind of go straight in. It's important. Go into the settings. Your, your words of wisdom of the day, among others. All right, now let's move on to the next part of this is switching basics, preview and program. So let's first start by defining what preview and program is. If I bring up my multi-view again, let's see, I bring up the multi-view. At the top, you see one that's labeled preview. Like they're both showing the same video, but see one's labeled preview and one's labeled in program. I don't even know which camera I'm supposed to look at. There it is. One's labeled preview, one's labeled program on there. What this means, the program is what your audience is seeing. The program is what is live on air. That is what the audience is currently actively watching. The preview is a place for you to get ready to set up something to bring to air. Now at its most basic, you can load, let's see, you got camera one that's on air and then you bring up camera two in the preview just to make sure that the talent on camera two isn't picking his nose before you go live. And then once he's done picking his nose, now you know it's time to go live, you can make a transition to either cut, wipe, you know, whatever transition over to that. And what'll happen in the video is you'll see them swap places, your preview and your program swap places. So your preview is what you can see getting ready to go to air. The program is what the audience sees. Now you notice when I brought this view up that both the same thing was in both of these. And if I switch cameras to camera two, and this is again now controlling the, the, um, uh, the HM Mini Extreme ISO that is on my desk, so I'm controlling this right now. As I switch cameras, so here actually, let me go back to this view. As I'm switching cameras between cameras one and two, I'll just go between one and two right now. As I'm switching between these, what you're seeing is this. So both views are changing. And you're thinking, well, hold on a second. I thought you said that there was a preview. I want to preview it. So there's two things to know about previewing. First of all, I can at any time manually force a preview using the software or 
I can set up the ATEM so that by default, when I hit a button on the ATEM, it doesn't actually bring that live, it loads it into the preview. So there's two different ways of working. By default, when you open this thing, you get this out of the box, at least for the minis, I'm not sure about the constellations, but at least for the minis, it is gonna be set in this direct mode where when you push a button, that goes live. There is no separate preview. But you can change that, and that's that setting that I showed you earlier. So let's go back in and make that change now. So I'm gonna go into my software control, so rather the ATEM setup. So go into here, and I'm gonna change this switching mode from cut bus to program preview. So cut bus is a fancy way to say it just cuts directly to that angle. Program preview, I kind of wish it said program slash preview because that would probably make a little bit more sense, but program preview means now, let's close this and go back to here and close that again. Now let's go to the overhead. When I hit camera two, you see two now goes green. That means that two is the preview. Red is on air. Red is danger, danger. This is live on air. Don't mess it up. Green is your preview. This is ready to go on air. And if we look at the multi view, now you're going to see two different angles. So that is my preview camera and that is my on air camera. And what's kind of cool about using the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras is I know this without even looking at here because the BMPCC cameras have what's called a tally light. A tally light shows you whether that camera is on air or not. And I actually see on this camera a little red light, which tells me that's the one that's on air. And on this camera, I see a little green light telling me that that is the one that's in preview. Oh, if there are 50 cameras in here, they would all be green except for the one that is on air, which is really nice little feature in there. Love that tally light that's built into the camera. So one of those little extra things to know about using the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras. Anyway, so now that we've got this set up with preview mode, now, and we understand that, now we can go to the next part of this, which is transitions. So now we can understand how transitions work. Now it's not to say that you have to use the uh, program preview mode to use transitions, you can manually load up a preview by going into the software and choosing your preview from here. So you'll see down here, I've got my program, what's the program and what's preview. So even if I'm in the other cut bus mode, I can still set up a preview here. So I can kind of temporarily override it, but as far as controlling it from the hardware itself, then you have to switch the modes in there to do that. Um, all right, so now that we've got it set up to do preview and program, now it's much easier to do custom transitions. So here's how that works. All right, let's go, let's start with a basic one. Um, I'm going to first show you in the software. So let's go back to here. You have down here in the software, a series of transition styles. Mix, which is a cross dissolve. Dip, which is gonna be like a dip to black. Wipe, which is what the name sounds. Like stingers, we're not gonna get into stingers today. And a DVE, which we're not gonna really get into, but they're just kind of more advanced transitions. These are your transition styles. You can choose from these. You also have, if I go to the palettes over here, and I look at my transitions page on here, this is where you take control over what wipe you're using, what DVE you're using, um, what color you're going to dip to when you dip to when you do a dip, how, uh, well, I guess in the mix, the only thing you can change in here is the time, but you can change more about those individual settings from the transition page in here. So let's just set it to a real simple mix to start. So that is now set to mix. How long is my transition gonna be? That's here under the rate. So set to a, a one second and 20 frame rate right now. Now there's two buttons next to it. There's cut and auto. Cut is going to just do a straight cut. So the no transition, just a straight cut. But auto is going to run that transition. So this is going to automatically run the transition from preview to program and using whatever settings we have up here. So let's see here. I'm going to now bring up the multi-view again. And then I'm going to hit the auto button in the software and you're gonna see that cross dissolve over. So again, the program, the program is what the audience is seeing. You saw that fading over. As soon as the fade was done, then the preview switched to the other camera. We don't see the actual transition happen in the preview window, that's not necessary, but you see the transition in the program. So again, if I hit the auto button again, we will see the transition and then it cuts over on the preview. So now let's change it to something else. For example, I'll go to wipe and let's, let's go back to here. So I set it to wipe and let's do a, uh, I'll do a little angle wipe on here. Okay, angle wipe on there. Now let's go back to this view and I hit auto and there's an angle wipe. So you have all these different types of transitions that you can choose from in here. Now I'm controlling it here in the software, but you can also do this from the hardware. Let's go to the overhead view again and you'll see on here that there are a, uh, a variety of preset buttons built into here. So I've got like, there's that angle wipe that I just did. Let's set that to a circle wipe instead. And I can also set four preset durations, half a second, one second, one and a half or two seconds. So I'm gonna put it at one second and I've got a one second circle 
effect in there. And now to do the auto, right, do the transition, there's that auto button. So I have my fingers on that. Let me go back to the multi view and then I hit the auto button and there's that transition. So you have control over that from the hardware and you have that control on the mini as well. So if it, not as many, uh, let's go back to the overhead view, not as many controls, but you do have some controls over them as well. You see there's just more of them on here more space for more buttons some more controls on the hardware, but you can do some of this from the hardware or you can do all of it from the software. And I think that's, that's a good point now to make that point. Good time to make that point. There is a lot that you can do from the hardware, a lot. But to have full control over your ATEM, whether you're talking about the mini model up to the Constellation 8K, to have full control, you gotta go into the software. You can actually buy hardware panels, big, huge controls with a billion buttons on them, those are scary, but that gives you really, you know, full on tactile control of every aspect of the ATEM, um, or you can do it all through software on here. And you can do, it can get complicated when you have a lot of things to set up in software. So this is where macros come in, building a macro to, uh, to pre-build something, to pre-build a picture in picture effect, that sort of thing. And there's even third party solutions for doing that. There's apps that you can run on iOS. There's apps that you can run on a browser based system on any platform that will take control of the ATEM and even give you different methods of controlling it that you the things that you can't really do in macro. So it's pretty impressive, the third party solutions. We don't have time to get into all of those today, but know that you are not locked into only doing what you can with the ATEM hardware and software and the macros. There are third party solutions that really open up whole new worlds, especially important if you are trying to control multiple hardware at once. So just to talk about that very, very briefly, if we look at, we bring this into view here. Um, oops, I wanna, no, I wanna go to the overhead, there we go. This is a Elgato Stream Deck. This is running, most of my show. And a lot of these buttons are doing multiple things. Like when I sit, switch to camera A, it's not just switching to camera A, it's also ensuring that my upstream keys are turned off so I don't get some weird overlays. There's a lot of stuff that I can do from here and that is through a software system called Companion and that is running, you know, it's a browser-based thing that's running and it's integrating with this. That will allow me to control multiple pieces of hardware at once. A single button can trigger multiple ATEMs, multiple, the HyperDex and do all kinds of things which I cannot do from macro. So whole other level of power and control in there that you might want to look into as you get really deep into this rap, deep down this rabbit hole. Okay, um, transitions, I think that's all we really need to say about that. Oh, one, one last thing I'll show you on transitions. You have this thing here called the T-bar. This T-bar is your transition, but it's running it manually. So you can see on here with the auto button and the rate number will change as I am moving this. And so if I bring back up the overview here and I do this transition, I can drag it up and drag it back and drag it up. And I know you can't see me dragging it, but up and back. So I have like full on control over that manually. You could even, if you wanted to, for some strange reason, do a halfway split here and just kind of leave it there and get that dual image. I, you know, you can do anything you want. There's all kinds of fun stuff. But there's, that's enough about transitions. I think that makes the point of what needs to be pointed out on transitions. Gary, do we have any questions? Do I want to do a quick little Q&A before we, before we do anything else? Yeah, sure, we can have a couple of questions here. Um, initially, one was, uh, will the stream be available later offline? And related to that, will a recording be available to registered users? Okay, so it will be available on afterwards, um, probably next week, maybe the week after. You know what, here's, here's what I'll do. So the URL that I gave you in the beginning, photojoseph.com slash ATEM, that redirects to the stream. I will leave that URL active. I will make this show public on my YouTube channel, but that's gonna take a couple of weeks because, um, just because. So um, I, will, I will leave the recording up. So the 4K stream, which seems to be holding up pretty well. I'm, I'm looking at my status of the 4K, it looks like it's pretty good. So that URL will work for a couple of weeks. And in fact, even once I, I re-upload the show in full quality, that URL will redirect to that new page when that goes up. So the short answer is yes, you will have access to this afterwards on YouTube. You will not be getting a link to the Zoom recording. It will only be on YouTube, which I know is very different from most of the Blackmagic webinars. That doesn't happen, but I have special permission to do this for you guys. So, so that's how that happens. Okay, uh, there's that question answered. Anything else, Gary? Yeah, sure. Uh, this kind of relates to the cameras, but it's a good question. Um, uh, are you using a LUT in your camera right now? Or um, one person suggested that their cameras look flat and they'd like to know what the best way to set those up is. I know it's not related to the ATEM, but it's a good question. 
No, that's totally fine. So I'm assuming you're talking about the Blackmagic cinema cameras. So the, the cameras that I'm using for this live show, what you're seeing right now, those aren't the BMPCC cameras. Those are a separate camera system, and that's the look is dialed into the camera. So that's not relevant. But for the Blackmagic Pocket cinema cameras, there are uh, – you can load a custom light into it. I don't have one loaded in. I think I think it's just – set it to the film. It's kind of one of the default settings, but I also deliberately – warmed them up a little bit so that they would look different from these cameras. So it was a bit more clear when I was looking at those cameras for you as the audience. But when we get into the camera control stage of this, you'll see just how much control you do have over the cameras. You really can dial in that look or you can design a LUT. So if you're if you're any good at, um, at coloring, if you go into DaVinci Resolve, what you could do is take a, a test footage, you know, shoot some test stuff in log on your camera, bring that into Resolve, design a LUT that looks the way you want, get your colors the way you want, your shadows and everything the way you want, and then you can export that LUT and bring that into your Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera so that that is now loaded in there so that the HDMI out will have that LUT embedded into it. And you can then record one of the things that we're not going to get to demo today, but since we're talking about it, I'll just, I'll just mention it now to make sure I don't forget. Remember I was talking about the ISO... Um, the, the A10 Mini Stream and the A10 Mini ISOs where they record all the ISO streams, one of the other things that they can do is not only do they record the ISO streams as they came into the switcher on a little hard drive, if you're using, and that works with any cameras, if you're using Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras, you can have the cameras simultaneously record RAW, so Blackmagic RAW internally, and then when you take those files into your computer along with the uh, the XML file that is being generated by the ATEM, they all match up basically magically. And you now have your whole live show that you were streaming in 1080p with an embedded look. You have that same show in 4K or 6K, if you're using the 6K cameras, in RAW so that you can do anything you want to the colors. So even if you have created a custom LUT and, and drop that into the camera, that would be embedded on the HDMI out, which is what you're going to be seeing here. But the recorded RAW file will not have that LUT embedded, so you can reapply the same LUT if you want in post, or you can start over and come up with a whole new look. Very, very powerful, very powerful way to work in there. So, great question. Thank you. I'll add uh, just a couple of things. That Basically, all of our cameras do have a built-in lookup table that, um, that changes the film mode to video or extended video. So if you set your cameras to film mode uh, for recording, which gives you the best dynamic range, then for the video outputs, you can set the built-in LUT to be uh, film to video or film to extended video, and it'll look more like a, a 709 uh, style video signal. Uh, you can also add or build on that if you want. Cool. Powerful stuff. Very powerful cameras. And one more thing that I thought I'd add because we were talking about transitions, there is a button uh, called Preview Transition, which is both a feature and also a trap, if you wanted to say uh, a word or two about that. The Preview Transition. I'm, I'm now thinking, do I... Oh, yeah. <laughs> my ATEM, my big ATEM doesn't have that, so I don't... I, I'm like, oh, yeah, look, there's that button on there. Um, sure. Let's look. At, I'm, I'm assuming that lets you preview the... I've actually never used this before. Let's find out. Let's do this together. All right, let's go back to the computer. You'll see here there is this preview transition button. So I'm currently set up, uh, let's see, 4K to 6K camera, and I've got a wipe set. Let's, let's do a different one. I'll set this to DVE. No, let's do, a, let's do a wipe. Let's do a wipe and just do something totally different here. We'll do like a little four square wipe, and I'm going to take the softness off of this just so we have something different to do. So let's take that softness down. All right. So now, presumably, I'm going to switch over to the multi-view. If I hit the preview, we're probably going to see that in the preview. Nope. Oh, I see. I hit preview and then hit auto. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Okay, so preview. Oh, neat. <laughs> Learn something every day. So this is a toggle. So once that is on, now these buttons are only going to make their transition in the preview. So go back to this again, and now I'm seeing it in the preview. Well, that's kind of cool. I, that's funny, Gary. I actually never knew that. Was, is that new? <laughs> yeah, the idea was to let you uh, preview even a complicated one with keys and things like that so that you can see it in the preview side without it going on air. Brilliant. Where the trap is, is that the button can get hit inadvertently either on the uh, hardware panel or in the software, and then nothing changes on air, and that can get very confusing for people. And uh, so we've had a few calls on that. Oh, okay, that makes sense. There's no button for that on the A10 Mini hardware, right? You're talking about on the control panels that has that. Got it. Neat.
I don't think my Magitim has that. Anyway. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> well, that's it for now. Okay, cool. All right, so let's go, uh, let's move on. So where were we? We're now going to talk about the upstream and the downstream keys. So first off, let's just define what these are. At their core, and this is, this is the kind of explanation that a broadcast person would look at me and say, stop saying that, it's not accurate, but it's good enough and it helps to explain what it is. Think of it like layers, like layers in Photoshop. You can have multiple layers and those layers can have graphics, they can have video, they can have parts of video, they can be picture in picture, it can be anything you want within reason, um, but they are effectively layers. And the difference between the upstream and the downstream keys are twofold. First of all, they're positioning. The downstream key is the last thing in the layer. So if I'm the primary video, you know, you're looking at me right now, and then I start adding upstream keys. So they're kind of upstream from me. The downstream key is the farthest one down the line. That is the last thing in the line. It sits on top of everything else. And traditionally a downstream key would be used for something that's on screen all the time, like a little network bug. You see in the corner, it like says, you know, CNN, NBC, whatever, little corner bug there. That's typically where a downstream key would get used. Now that said, you can actually use a downstream key for a lot more. You can use it for a full lower thirds title if you want to, but the intention is more that you would do that in the upstream keys. But because you can do some things like that in the downstream keys, it does give you another layer of effects and things, graphics, whatever, that you can add to your video. So if you run out of upstream keys, you can do stuff in your downstream keys as well. Now that said, the downstream, downstream keys don't have as many options as the upstream keys, but at their core, they're the same thing. So let's take a look at what's going on here in the software. So here we have our, I'll start with the downstream keys. So here we see DSK for downstream key one and two. So this ATEM Mini Extreme ISO has two downstream keys. And effectively the way these work, and we're not gonna go super deep into how to connect all these together, but you have this thing called tie, which will tie your tra tie that um, that downstream key into your next transition. So this allows you to effectively bring it up in the preview. And when your next transition goes, it will bring that in. It ties it in with that transition. That's one way to look at that. Um, or you can simply bring it on air with the on air button or auto bring it on air using whatever transition style you have set up. So a variety of ways to bring that on air. And if we look over here on the right, you'll see, let me collapse all these palettes. You'll see up here, you have a whole bunch of different palettes, color generator, super source, four upstream keys, transitions, and then a downstream key. So if I open that up, you'll see there's two in here, key one and key two, and there's not a whole lot of options in here. Within the downstream key, you're choosing a fill source. So what is that downstream key going to be? And then the key source, and this is gonna apply in the, the upstream keys as well. So let's talk about what that actually means right now. So you have your fill source, and your key source. If you think about your uh, a network logo, like again, using that as an example, you need to have transparency, right? Your, your network logo is a little logo that is just gonna sit in the corner. And of course, it's not gonna block the entire image, it's just sitting in the corner. And that network logo might even have transparency to it. It might be kind of a 50% opacity, so you can see what's going on behind it, but you know, only kind of. All of that opacity has to be controlled with something. ATEMs don't read transparency in the sense of, uh, uh, I always way to describe this. There's no control in there to, to kind of paint out the transparency. There is if you get into the Chroma King, we'll get into that. But as far as most things, you're gonna bring in a graphic, you need to have a way to tell the software, or tell the hardware, where the transparent areas is. And so that's a whole separate file or separate part of the same file that is your key. If you ever use Photoshop and you know what an alpha channel is in Photoshop, same idea. The, the alpha channel or the key is a black and white file and it can have shades of gray in it for, for graduate transparency, graduated transparency, things like drop shadow, stuff like that. But black, I always get them backwards. Black is going to be transparent. I think that's right. Um, it's gonna show uh, none of the incoming file of the media source. And then white is gonna show all of the media source and then any shade of gray will show part of it. And so typically what you're doing is you are loading in either two files. So you have your your fill and your key, or you're loading in a file that has that transparency built into it. And if you bring in a PNG file, PNGs, as you likely know, have transparency built into them. So a PNG file can be loaded in and it will extract that alpha channel from that file automatically. And now you've got your transparency. That said, and we're definitely not gonna get into a deep dive on this today, but there is something called pre-multiplied black that you need to understand when it comes to doing transparency. It is super, if you just have a real basic, like hard as just make it simple, a square against a transparent background, no shadows, nothing like that. Pre-multiply key means nothing. You don't, you don't need, to need to worry about it. But as you add a drop shadow 
having your key, uh, having your, your file designed with a pre-multiplied key is going to make that drop shadow look a lot better. And there's a couple ways to go about making those. There is actually a plugin for Photoshop that gets installed when you install the software. So if you're using Photoshop, on your system, then you can generate your graphics and then use an export from the Photoshop menu and actually send the file, the graphic directly to the ATEM. It actually loads it onto the hardware straight from Photoshop, crazy cool. And it sets it all up correctly. Or you can do a pre multiplied key manually. I actually have a full video on that. If you look on my YouTube channel, just search on YouTube, Photo Joseph, pre multiplied key, ATEM, and you'll find it. And I explain in there how to do it with Photoshop uh, using the plugin, and then I explain how to do it without the plugin if you want to use some other app. So that's an important thing to know. We'll just leave that at that. But effectively, at its, at its core, your, your two parts of your upstream or downstream keys are the source and the key. Where is the transparency coming from? What do you actually want to see on air? So if we go back to this, you'll see, um, once again, here we go. So where are we? Downstream keys. Uh, if you're going to do a transition, you can choose the rate that's going to come in. So that actually can be separated from the other transition. But you have your fill source and your key source. And typically, you're going to see it as media player one and media player one key. Although if I click on this, it can be anything. I can make that anything from my system. But in this case, it's going to be media player one and media player one key. Now, where what is the media player one? Well, that comes from this media tab down here. So if I load this up, you'll see that I have in here a bunch of media. So this media here is full screen. It's just a you know, some kind of texture or whatever loading in there. But then you get ones like this that look like they might actually have transparency. Now, this is already loaded up in Media Player 1. So that's, where's that button? Uh, there it is. There's the number one. It says that's Media Player 1. That's Media Player 2. So if I want to load something else, I can just drag and drop this in, and it will drop that into the right place. So let's go ahead and put that one in there. So this one, you know, says Photo Joseph on it. It looks like it's got some kind of funky, uh, I don't know, transition or something down there. I actually don't remember what this looks like. I made this forever ago. So let's go back over to here, and I can enable the downstream C. So I'm just going to turn this on. Let's bring DSK1 on air. And I know you can't see it yet. I'm going to bring that up in a moment. And Media Player 1 and Media Player 1 key. So I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to switch over to my multi-view, and then I'm going to turn that on. And now you can see that on air there. So that is now there. It's got the transparency on it. That is at its core what a downstream key was. And it, it is. And we can, again, use it as a lower third or more traditionally use it as a bug or something like that. Upstream keys, same idea, but with a lot more power. So let's go to those. Let me go back to this view. Let's turn off that downstream key. And let's look at our first upstream keys. So first of all, you have under upstream keys, four different types, luma keys, chroma keys, pattern keys, and DVE keys. So let's explain what each one of these are. Luma key is what I just described. It is a key that is based off of a alpha channel, a black and white or black and gray file that is uh, defining where the transparency is. So that's, that's what the luma key is, right? Um, luma key source can be a still photo like you just saw in here, or it can actually be video. Now, if you're going to bring in video and you want to have it with transparency, so this would be, you know, I had that lower third, but this would be like an animated lower third, something that comes in, then you have to bring in two separate video files. So one video file is the source and the other one is the alpha channel. And that, those two video files could be played separately, but that would be tough to make sure the timing is precise. Typically, the way that you would do this is you would use a graphics package like, um, like After Effects or Apple's Motion, something like that, where you render out to a ProRes 4444 file. That fourth four is the alpha channel, and that is, a, uh, that is what's going to allow you to have transparency. Then you would load that video file onto something like a HyperDeck. The HyperDeck is going to have two outputs. It has going to have an A and a B output. One of them is going to have your video file. One of them is going to have the key. And the hardware automatically, it sees that 4444 file, and it goes, oh, OK, I'll send this part here, this part here, and you automatically get that transparency on screen. Super, super powerful and awesome. Now, can you do that with the ATEM Mini Extremes? Uh, the ATEM Minis, the ones with the HDMI input? You certainly can. The HyperDex all have SDI outs. So you would have to convert that SDI to HDMI, but it does work. It is going to take up two of your inputs, but that absolutely can be done. So a HyperDeck will allow you to do that. You cannot, we'll talk about this again when we get to the media tab, you cannot load any kind of video animations into the ATEM, only still graphics. So if you want video stuff, you got to play that externally, and a HyperDeck is the best way to do it. Not the only way to do that, but it is definitely the easiest way and best way to do that. So that's what a Luma key is, both for still and for video. Then we get to chroma key, and this is the fun one. So the chroma key is our green screen stuff. So chroma 
for chrominance, colors, luma for luminance, the black and white. So a chroma key is a, typically you often hear it called as a green screen or a blue screen key, but it can really be any color. Any color that you want can be, uh, can be turned into the, the transparent part of it. So the way that this works, unlike with a Luma key, where you are generating your file in advance and it has the, render, the transparency rendered into the file, a chroma key is generally used for live video with something like a green screen backdrop. And then the hardware is removing that green in real time and allowing that to be transparent so that you can see whatever you want behind it. So this is gonna be a fun part of the demo. We're, okay, we're good on time. This is gonna be a fun part of the demo. Um, that is the most likely to go wrong today, but let's, let's see what happens. Let's see how that goes. So let's see if my presets that I set up earlier work. Um, figure out, here we go, my keying demo. So I'm gonna bring this up to start. All right, actually, before I even do that, let's set up my green. Here it is. So I have, this is not gonna be the world's best green screen key, but I have a little pop-up green screen here. So I'm gonna see if I can open this without knocking anything over here. It's actually quite large and it's very dangerous back here. Oh, I just realized, uh, I never turned on my colors in the background. I'll set that up later. So um, this is a nice little pop-up green screen. I'm just gonna set this over here. And this is obviously not perfectly accurately lit. If you're gonna do a real green screen, then you want that lit properly as evenly as you possibly can. It just, it makes your whole green screen keying experience much better. But for now, we've got a little pop-up here. Okay, so now that that's in place, Go to my keying demo, all right? And you can now see the software. So I'm actually going to switch over to my other ATEM. Um, this ATEM, this is the little mini extreme. This has a little chroma sample thing that makes it really easy to actually sample the color from the live video. My older, bigger ATEM doesn't have that, so I have to do it manually. But I want to just want to show you that if you're using one of the newer ATEMs, you actually have this built in, which is, makes it a lot easier. But I am going to go up to my software control here. Then I'm going to load up my big ATEM and set this to chroma. And so you see that that's missing. I don't have that little sample in here. So I'm going to be doing it to this video here. All right. So now think through this, make sure I do all this right. So currently you're looking at what's called a super source. You are looking at a split screen that is done with the super source. We're going to explain super source more in a bit that where we're seeing half of my computer screen shift it over to the side. So that's what this is here. So you're only seeing the, the right hand side of my screen. If I move, I can move the window over so you can see the whole thing, but you're actually only seeing the right hand side of my screen and you are seeing a portion of this video feed, right? So that video feed is just cut off on the side. So uh, there we go. I'm going to drop out that green in the background, but there's nothing back there now. So instead of just, uh, just keying to nothing, we want to see something. So let's load something into the background. So when you're doing a green screen key or chroma key, you first, your base layer, your, your primary video feed needs to be whatever you want in the background. That can be a photo, it can be video, it can be whatever you want. So I am going to go over here to my media player. And I think, can you see this on your screen? I need to move this over a little bit. Uh, doo -doo -doo, there we go. So I'm going to go to the media player. And it loaded up um, a graphic that was not what I wanted. So let's go back to this shot and actually go to, let's go to the, this shot here. I'm gonna go down to my media tab and I'm going to load up. Uh, oh, my pictures are slowly loading back up. Let's see here, um, Sunrise 2, this is what it was. Let's load that into here. And with any luck, now it's downloading. Oh, we'll have to give this a moment. I've neglected to load this up in advance. So it is now currently downloading all the graphics. Uh, apparently that sunrise photo is large, so we're gonna have to wait for that. Kind of an interesting thing about the ATEMs, the graphics get loaded into the hardware, but then when you load the software, they have to get re-downloaded from the hardware back to the software so you can see what they are. Just make sure you launch your software and go to that page before your live show, especially if you have a lot of graphics. Okay, back to this. So there's that graphic, little sunset picture. Okay, that is now in place. Let me go back to the switcher here. I'm going to go back to the media player. There we go, there's my background here. And now let's go back to my little keying demo setup and turn that media player back on. Oops, uh, wrong one, sorry. That's... Oh, right, sorry about that. I forgot I need to actually do this in the super source. So we're going to go to super source. That's right, I knew that I was gonna be giving you a little bit more of a demo of super source before we actually got to the demo of super source and that is right here. So here's effectively what super source is. It's a multi box layout. You can see here a box control. I have up to four boxes in my super source. Box one is currently turned on. That is my front wide camera. So you see that there. So if I turn that off, I disappear. Bring that back and there I am again. So I'm going to set that to media player one. 
There we go. So there is now my my um, new box one. If I switch, if I go to box two, box two is actually the screen that you're seeing right here. So I can turn that on and off and you see that screen. So box two is the computer. Box one is the Sunrise graphic. That's the last I'm going to say about SuperSource for now. Now, let's go to Upstream Key and go to Chroma Key. And we're going to do this in Upstream 1. So I'm going to turn this on to start. And I've got to reset. Uh, shoot. Give me a second. Oh, yeah. Going to let me see, turn that off. Let me go in here and choose what the fill source is first before I bring it to air. So I'm going to choose that to be me, which is front wide. I think it was the front wide that I wanted. Now I bring that back to air. There we go. So now we're seeing front wide and we're already seeing through something. We're seeing through the blue in there, which is uh, obviously not the right one that we want. So we want to cut out the green. I'm also going to turn on a mask on here. There we go. So that I can cut that in half. So the masking is, is in combination with the upstream key, the chroma key. So you see I've enabled mask on here. It's, um, where are we? Uh, left side. So here, if I go in here and I make a change in here, like let me change that to say 10, then it crops over more. If I set that to, uh, you know, eight, whatever it's there. So I'm just going to set that to zero, which is right down the middle. And there we go. So now I've cut that off. So I'm cutting that out, which incidentally is very useful because as you already saw on my actual green screen setup here, setup, the, um, the green screen didn't cover my whole background. So if I just want to cut me out and I wanted to have a floating head here, a floating body, you know, like transparency, I would need to cut out some of that other background. And that's where the crop comes in, the masking. Anyway, now let's choose the right color. So you'll see in here, I've got my little hue slider. So now I just got to adjust this to find the right color to drop out that background. And there we go. And then from there, it's just refining it. So you've got gain and Y suppression slider. So you can really kind of dial that in. I got to look at a different monitor, see how clean this is. Um, find the right color here. That's pretty good. Uh, there's a bunch of controls in here to control that, but effectively, I mean, that's looking pretty decent right now. We're going to call that good enough for the demo. But that is what your, your green screen keying, your chroma keying is. You have that um, you have that chosen color that is going to drop out. In this case, it's that shade of green back there. You can see that it's not perfect because, again, this isn't perfectly lit. But if it was perfectly evenly lit, then you have a much cleaner, easier time doing the key. You will see some, some edging around. Some of this can be cleaned up with a bit of fiddling. But it's not going to be flawless through here. If you want to get absolute perfection in your key, then you're going into, um, into external hardware. So that's... But that's a whole separate thing, and maybe one day we'll do a show on that. But for now, uh, what you can do in here is kind of a basic level. You can see, like, if I wiggle my fingers, you can see some flaws in there where some of the green is showing through, but it's fine for the vast majority of uses. So that's how that works. So that's what the chroma key is. So now with that said, let me go back to get the right mode set up here. So I want to go to turn off super source. I'm going to bring up just this shot, and I'm going to turn the key back on. No, I want to go... Here, there we go. There we go. So there's the kind of the whole thing in there. Oh, I'm cut off. Let me let me turn off that masking. There we go. So now you can see, <laughs> you only see the background through the green thing. So now as I take this down, this is kind of the fun part of this. So I take this and you know wherever I put this, I'm going to try and fold this thing up without breaking anything. You will see that. God, this thing is such a huge beast of a. It's like this big pop up. There you go. Let's see. Look, it's like it's a window into, it's a window into the distance. It's fun. I mean, fun with green screens. Anyway, so that's how that works. Okay, let's get that out of the way. Let's turn off the green screen key. Let's go back to the video of me. And what I neglected to do earlier was turn on my fancy background light. So let's do that just to make this background set look that much more dynamic. Isn't that cool? Okay. Whew. I made it without breaking anything. I, you know, that was pretty good. Considering all the different, there's three ATEMs involved in this, FYI. Just because of how I'm showing this, obviously during a normal green screen key, you don't need three ATEMs for this, but that's just how I have things set up. Okay, hey Gary, let's see if there's any questions. Let's see here, go back to Gary. Do we have anything for the questions? Yeah, at the moment there aren't any questions. Okay, well then we'll just move on. I just need an excuse to have some water. All right. Moving on then. Hope you guys are having fun here. Um, what is next? Oh, right. We have to finish going through the upstream keys. So let's go back to here. Um, we already looked at, so we talked about Luma and Chroma keys. Then there's the pattern keys, which, you know, this is pretty self-explanatory. It's instead of having a key that's based off of the uh, a separate file, a 
key that's based off of color. It's just a key. Oops, it's just a key based off of pattern. So, if you want to have um, you know like a little circle bit of video in there, you can do that. The DVE key is probably one of the most used ones because this is where you get your picture in picture. So let's set this up. I'm going to turn on the DVE key and let's turn off. Let's see here. I'm going to set my key source to be me. So let's go to front wide. There we go. And if we let me move this out of the way so you can actually see the controls at the same time. So here, if we look at these, you see you have, first of all, your fill source. What do I want to show up in this DVE key? Again, also commonly referred to as a picture in picture. The fill source can be any camera angle. So I can switch that to my close-up camera. I can switch that to my overhead camera. I can switch it to whatever camera I want. Let's go back to the front wide. Then down here, I have my position, X and Y positions. I can click on these, and this goes for all of these fields. I can go in here and I can type in a number. So I can say, you know, five, hit enter, and it pops over to the five position. Or, let's do that minus five, so it goes to the other side. There we go. Or you can little use these little steppers to do them. Or if you hover the mouse right over the letter, then it turns into a double-headed arrow, and now you can drag it around, which is certainly the easiest way to get things into position quickly. So you can do, change your X and Y position, right, like so. You have your size on here, so what size do I want it to be? And you can even unlink the size if you want to distort it. Probably not ever a good idea, but I can say, do I want this to be, a, you know, is this a little picture-in-picture, big picture-in-picture, whatever I want in there? And you can even rotate it. So I can go into, there's no thing to drag in here, so I'll say, like, you know, rotate this 15 degrees because I'm feeling, I'm feeling crooked today. Uh, 50, oh, sorry, it's 50, that's not the degrees one. Let's go back into that. That is the number of times degrees. So let's go, it's kind of a strange way to do it. We'll say three degrees, three degrees. And for whatever reason, we want to rotate it three degrees, five times. So we'll enter five in there. And I don't even know why that's not doing that. I think I'm messing something up in there, but that's okay. Let's just stick, I never do this, obviously, because there's really not much point in putting yourself jaunty angled here, but if you wanted to, you could. We'll put that back to zero. But there's your basic picture in picture. And even within there, you can do a mask. So let's say that I want a picture in picture, but I don't want all of me. So I'm standing off to the side here, right? Let's say I want to design a picture in picture. We're using this video, but only part of it. So I can enable the mask. I can then go to my uh, my crop, my left crop, and let's say um, 16 should go about halfway through. There we go, that's halfway through. Um, I can bring in the right side a little bit. Let's go like three on there and bring that in a little bit. I can, you know, if I just want my head on there, I can go to the bottom and I'll type in like 10 on the bottom. And now I've got just a little head. So now I've got that little head that I can reposition and scale independently. So there we go. So now you can totally set that up however you want. And if you wanted that to be a round picture in picture, that's where the pattern key would come in. You do it as a round um, using the pattern. You can even do shadows on here and so on. So there's other and borders, there's all kinds of fun little stuff you can do in here. So there is your DVE keys in your picture in picture. Now with that said, here's something super important to look at. Um, let's see here. We have been doing this through the big ATEM. So I'm going to switch back over to, let's go ahead and turn off that key. Let's switch this over to the other ATEM the ISO that is on my desk in front of me. Okay, so now we're looking at that one, which means we're looking at this one here. This has a series of picture-in-picture -picture buttons on it. These are little preset layouts. And if I turn this, I'm gonna turn it on, and then I'm gonna cycle through these six buttons in here. I'm gonna do that while you're in this view here. So first I turn it on, you see that picture-in-picture, -picture, and then I go through the preset. So this first preset, and you can see it's a tiny picture-in-picture -picture up there. Um, you know, lower, lower left, lower right, do a two side by side. All of these can be controlled from here. But here's a really, 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 really important thing to understand about designing your picture in picture. All that work that I just did designing that picture in picture manually, that was on the other ATEM. Let's just pretend for the sake of the demo that I had done that on this ATEM here. I got it perfect. It took me an hour, but I finally got it perfect. Everything is exactly where I want it. And then I've got my little on and off button there, and that's great. That will toggle that picture in picture on and off all day long. But then you accidentally hit one of those other little buttons, the little presets. You accidentally hit one of these buttons here. There is no undo. There is no undo. So if you hit one of those presets, it is going to load its presets, preset positions into your, your picture in picture, into your DVE key, and all the settings that you had put in there will be gone. So how do you ensure that you have your settings saved? macros. 
Again, we're going to do that at the very end of today, but macros is where you set up your positioning exactly where you want. These buttons on here are unfortunately not programmable, so they are locked into what they are locked into. It's hardware written in the hardware, that's it, that's all they will ever do. There are on the ATEM Extreme, on the ATEM Mini Extremes, there are macro buttons. If we go back over here, you'll see, um, where we? oh, here we go, macros. This says, I know it's kind of a far away view, but there's six macro buttons on here. These will trigger the first six macros. This is the only customization that you have in this hardware. And it's not even customizing the hardware. It is simply triggering the first six macros. It's in the software. You can make those first six macros, whatever you want them to be. So if you were doing something where you wanted multiple picture-in-picture -picture layouts, the way that you would recall those instantly would be with macros and you could recall them instantly on the hardware by using those macro triggers or forget about the hardware and just do it all in software but again the macros is how you're going to ensure that you are saving your settings and we, again we'll talk about it at the end it's kind of the last thing we're doing today but it is really important to have your macros uh, to understand how to set up macros so that you get all that uh, saved correctly and understand that if you hit one of those little buttons and you have not saved your layout as a macro you will lose it. So you have been warned. It's very important. Did I mention that part? It's very, very important. All right, there you go. Okay, um, I think that is enough for the keys. Let's now move on to the next slide, which would be super source. So let's talk about super source. We already talked about it a little bit, but we're gonna go a bit deeper now. The super source is only in the larger ATEMs. It's in the, in the extremes. It's not in the, these little ATEM minis. These don't have super source, but the extremes do. I believe all the constellations have it. Gary, could you confirm that for me, please? I'm pretty sure all the constellations have super source. And so what is super source? Super source is what gives you the ultimate flexibility in your layout. You have uh, four different windows that can be positioned, scaled, cropped, wherever, however you want, positioned wherever you want, with another layer of video or graphic in the background behind it. And then on top of that, you can put your upstream keys. So let's imagine, if you will, the news, broadcast news style layout. You've got a panel of four talking heads. So you've got one, two, three, four talking heads. Then you have your background. You want some kind of animated thing, right? You want something with whatever in the background, or maybe it's some broadcast news piece, but there's some video happening in the background. So that background layer, that's your, your primary video. That's your your what you would load up into program. And then on top of that, you load your super source, your one, two, three, fours. Within the super source, you'll see you have control over, like I said, the size positioning and so on. But now you need to add names to everybody. So now your names are gonna happen with your upstream keys. And this ATEM has four upstream keys, how convenient. So you can have a separate key, a separate name, upstream key for each individual person that's on screen. And then you could use your downstream keys to put some kind of like breaking news thing at the bottom and your you know network logo bug in the corner. All of that stuff can be done through super source, upstream and downstream keys, combining them all together. So this is where the real extreme power of the hardware comes in. So let's take a look at how this actually works. So let's go back over to this view. I am controlling the A10 Mini Extreme ISO. So that's the one we're gonna look at here. And I'm going to, uh, let's see here. Let's first give a tour of how this works in here, and then I'll bring it up on screen so you actually see the stuff that I'm doing and the changes that I'm making. All right, let me collapse all these extra things in here to clean this up a little bit again. And okay, so now we're only looking at super source on here. You have control over your super source here. We're going to go through all of this. To enable super source, that's one of your programs. So your program is super source. So this is something to understand about the way this works is normally in your program, you've got which program, uh, which camera angle you want up on air. If you go to super source, then that becomes the camera angle that is on air, which means that you control what's in the background through this thing called the art layer. That is what's the background of your super source. So you have uh, kind of five layers, if you will, within the super source. You have up to four individual windows and you have your art layer, your background layer. So all of that is in here under super source. So that is turned on right now. And if I switch over to it, um, it just looks like trash right now. So I'm not even gonna load it up. But now let's start playing with what our layouts are. So you have four different preset layouts. Again, these are not customizable. It's just, these are just four presets. So I'm gonna load up this first one. And let's see here. And let me go ahead and bring up the, bring up the multi view on that. In fact, I'm gonna go, let's do this. Let's bring up the program. So, okay, you're seeing the program out. Let me turn off that upstream key. There we go. So this is the super source as it's set up right now, which is kind of a mess because I haven't done anything to it, but that's four windows. I only have 
three inputs. In fact, let me turn my iPad on. That'll be a third input here. Uh, let's go let just load up like a pictures page or something. Okay, there we go. So we've got some photos in here. Cool. Um, and oh, you're not even seeing it because that's not loaded into one of the super sources yet. So that's now we have three sources coming in. So let's go back over to the software and let's understand what these layouts mean. So again, there's four different positions of layout. So that was one, um, two, three, and four, and there's kind of different crop layouts on there. But let's just leave it at this basic one, basic four up grid. You have down here your control. Which box are you controlling? Box one, two, three, and four. And you see it's enabled. Each box has a checkbox to enable or disable it. Right now, these are all enabled because I chose a four up preset. If I was to choose this one here, for example, box four is now turned off. I think box three is gonna be off. Box two and one, those are gonna be on. So this is where you're controlling whether the box is on or not. Let's go back to this preset. Then underneath that, you have your source. What is in that box? So right now, box one has that 4K camera. That's my input one. Let's set box two to have the 6K camera. Great. Let's set box three. You see it was set to black. We're going to set that to the iPad. And then box four, we're going to set to a media player. So scroll through there, media player one. All right, what was in media player one? Let's bring in a little silly graphic, color graphic, there we go. So that's in media player one. So now I have something in all four of these. So now if I go back to the program, you should see, there we go. Oh, and I have the background art layer. So let's set that up as well. Let's go back over here to the art layer. Fill source is gonna be media player two, and let's set a different graphic into media player two. We'll take this one and drop that into MP2. There we go. So now we should have a complete four up layout. There we go. So now this is super source at its basic. I've got four streams coming in. Two of them are cameras. So I've got a camera here and a camera here. Um, two of them are, well, one's a camera input. It's just my iPad sitting over here. So it's my iPad. And then the fourth one is one of the media players and the background is another media player. So this is kind of our basic little layout in here. Okay. So now the control that we have, let's go back over to presets, is to change their positioning, right? X, Y position, size, crop, so very similar to what you saw in the upstream key. So size, scale, and cropping you can do within here. So again, I, I'm not, I didn't set it up so I could show you both of these the same things, same time side by side, but I'll go back into this view there and I'm gonna take box one and I can, that would be box four, genius. Let's go back to box one, go back to box one. And now as I move that around, you see I have control over the positioning of box one. I have control over the sizing, so let's make it like, you know, 0.3 if I wanted to make that smaller in there. Um, and then I can put a crop on it if I wanted to crop it off. So let's crop that to like, you know, crop at the top a little bit. So you have all of that control over that positioning. So the kind of classic thing again would be, if you're thinking about your newscasters, you've got four side by side. Well, you can't fit four 16 by nine videos side by side and be able to see everybody clearly. So you crop them all in, right? You crop just a center column off of each person. So if I wanted to do that with these cameras, let's go back to this view. I will reset this. Uh, let's just do a little reset all on there. And actually let's go back to that default setting. And then so let's take the crop on this one and the left one here. Let's actually turn off here. Let's set up a, a newscaster thing with just two people. So I'm gonna turn off box three and I'm gonna turn off box four. Let's go back up to box one. So that is this one here. And I will crop that and I'm gonna take off the left. We're gonna take, let's see, 10 off the left. Is that enough? Oops, I'm, now I'm adjusting the wrong one. It's box two, I lied to you. That's box two. <laughs> And let's do 10 off the top there. Okay, so that's obviously not gonna work because of where I'm positioned. So you can customize it for each person. So for each guest that's calling in where they're sitting on screen. So let's say like 20, there we go, that's pretty good. So that's good for there. And then we'll go to box one and I'm going to crop the left of that. Like, let's try 10 again, do a little bit more. Let's do like 12. We'll take the right and do that. Like just a little bit, say five, and I'll sit kind of here. Okay, so now I've got those, and now I can individually size these. So we're gonna go to box one, we're gonna make it a little bit bigger. Let's make it like 0.6, and make that a bit bigger, and bring it down a little bit. You're starting to get the idea, but you can really control the complete layout of this, and this is totally a super source thing. Um, neat thing about this too is, let's say that, you know, like here, okay, these two views, it's actually a perfect example. That these two views, let's just say that it's two different people calling in. They've got two different camera setups. Clearly, this caller is bigger than this caller because of where the cameras are, their lenses, whatever. Well, that's not okay. I want to make them look the same. So I can now go to box two. Yep, got the right one. 
and let's scale it bigger. So I'm going to take this up to like 0.9. And now the heads are eh, not really the same size. Let's go to full 100% size. Okay, we're going to call that good. And then I'm going to reposition. And now I'll crop it to match. So let's do, uh, let's see here. I probably can only crop a little bit off the top on there. Whoa, that's a bit much. Let's try. Crop a little bit off the top there. Let's do a 2.5 crop. There we go. And you get the idea. I don't need to set this up perfectly, but you get the idea here. I can start to crop this in to make the sizes match. Bring in this, the right side a bit here. A bit too much. Ish, ish, we're getting there. Change the size a little bit, bring them down, and get the two looking roughly the same. You get the idea. Obviously, it's not perfect yet, but that's what you can do with this. You can take those individual boxes, crop them and scale them independently so that you can make everybody match. Obviously, it's a lot easier if everybody uses the same camera positioning and so on, but that's almost never the case if you're doing some kind of remote thing where people are calling in. So this allows you to completely customize that. Now, you might be thinking, okay, that's all cool, but you know, I'm not doing some broadcast thing within a room and I got three people and five cameras. and all. That's not my thing. But I do like the idea of bringing someone in over Zoom, let's say, and integrating them into the show. You can actually do that. You can bring in somebody remote via Zoom call into the ATEM. All you need is another computer that is connected to Zoom feeding the video into the ATEM. In fact, I did an entire video on this. It's one of my ATEM mini tips about integrating a Zoom caller into your show. And there's kind of multiple levels of it. Audio gets really complicated when you start doing stuff like that. But in that video, I explain all the, the caveats of it, how to work around them, how to have kind of your basic level and how to have your more advanced level by adding additional hardware. But if that's something you want to do, be able to bring in callers from Zoom or Skype or whatever, it doesn't FaceTime, anything, bring them into a live show, check out that video because it explains top to bottom how to set it up. And that is um, largely using SuperSource, but even if you don't have SuperSource, you can kind of fake it using an upstream key. So kind of a fun thing. So check that out. It's, it's pretty cool. Anyway, so that's, that's SuperSource. Again, the ability to take multiple inputs, up to four inputs, and position them wherever you want. Make your background layer whatever you want it to be. And um, yeah, and off you go. There's one more thing about the background. It's funny because I learned this from Gary the last time we did this video. Uh, I'm going to go back into the settings in here. If I look in the art page, so the art is that background, right? So, and I choose whatever I want it to be. Well, you can actually place your art in the foreground and then it wakes up as a key to have a key. So if it's in the background, I can't have a key. So the key is dimmed. Foreground, it can have a key. And at first I was like, well, I don't, why would I, I don't understand that. Well, what this means is that you can have a graphic, let's say you design a graphic in Photoshop that has holes cut out in it for your people. So you've got a graphic with, um, you know, a background, some kind of image, and then you have a border with drop shadows under the border and the text on the bottom and all this other stuff, but you cut a hole where the people are going to be. And then you bring in your super source videos and you lay this graphic on top of it. And now you've got transparency on that graphic seen to the video behind it. So instead of having your, your art layer being in the background, it can actually be on the foreground. Pretty slick. And it's a really neat way to get even more customization over this. And then don't forget, you can still add upstream keys on top of that because those happen after the super source in your sequence of events. So that is that. All righty. Um, mm -hmm. Is that everything? Oh, last thing in here in the super source tab is this little copy tab in here. This simply allows you to copy the settings from one box to another. So if I've got box one is fully laid out, I want to make box two in the same position, but you know, I'm going to change one axis or whatever, then this allows me to just copy those settings over. So it's just a little, little shortcut in there, a little convenient thing to do. Okay, I believe that's everything to talk about in SuperSource. Gary, I'm going to pull you back up, and let's see if there's any questions right now. And We might take this opportunity to take a break before we move on to the next part of it. Oh, I'm not hearing you, Gary. I am not hearing Gary. Is, uh, are other people hearing Gary? Nope, the audience is definitely not hearing Gary. There you go. So no one of the questions is uh, related to which uh, ATEM models have SuperSource and which do not. Um, if you want me to, I can answer or you could. I, I will answer and you can tell me if I'm wrong. I believe the, the SuperSource starts with the extremes. So all the extreme models have SuperSource. The base minis, the four input minis do not have SuperSource. And that is going to apply to the HDMI and the SDI models. And then you get into the constellations and I believe all the constellations have SuperSource. Uh, did I get that right? The uh, 
basically it kind of relates to the, how the older switchers were um, designed. So the 1ME constellation does not have super source, but the 2ME and the 4ME. So fundamentally all of our 2ME and 4ME switchers would have super source and um, the 1ME does not. Got it. And incidentally, what, what the ME means when you see this 1ME, 2ME, a multiple ME stands for mix effects. And this, what an multiple MEs allows you to do is to effectively have multiple program outs, unique program outs, up to four on the four ME. You think, why would you want multiple program outs? A perfect example of that is a, a live event where you are live streaming it or broadcasting, whatever, but you're live streaming it out to a remote audience, but simultaneously you're gonna show the video up on a projector. You know, like again, a concert's a great example. You wanna have footage up on the concert, uh, up on the walls around there, but then you're also gonna live stream this. You might wanna live stream something different than what is being shown up on the projection screen. So you can have, through a single ATEM, multiple MEs. And you could do, it could be as simple as it's all the same video, but only your live stream has lower third graphics and stuff like that. Like you don't need those lower thirds on the, on the big projection screen in the middle of the concert hall. Or it can be completely separate and they can actually be controlled by multiple people. One of the cool things about putting these on the network, and I said in the beginning that you, know, you plug them into the network and you have to plug them in over USB to make some changes to them, to the network settings. You can actually control, at least for the ATEM minis, I don't know about the constellations, but you can do all the control over USB. You don't have to put them on the network. But when you do it over USB, you're limited to that one computer controlling that ATEM. If you put it on the network, multiple computers can control the same ATEM. So you could have one operator who's just in, in charge of sound. And they have, they're open on the sound panel, they're doing all the sound effects. You have one that's in charge of graphics. You could have one that's in charge of one ME and one that's in charge of another ME. So you can do some crazy stuff when you have multiple MEs and multiple operators. I'm just throwing that out there as a kind of ex extra level of what you can do. All right, go ahead, Gary, sorry. Sure, and one more question. Um, can you explain again the difference between upstream keyer and downstream keyer? So fundamentally, the difference is two. There's the positioning of it. The downstream key is the last thing in the chain. So that's the one that's going to be on top of everything else. You don't have um, a layer ordering. You can't go, oh, let me take upstream two and move it behind upstream one. It, you have upstream key one, and then two, then three, then four, and then downstream key one and two. That's That layer is fixed. So that's part of it. And the second part of it is simply the amount of controls that you have. In the downstream key, it's just a Luma key, and it's pretty basic in its control levels designed primarily for the bug or maybe a lower third, whereas the upstream key has the four different types, your Luma key, your Chroma key, your DDE key, and your, uh, dub, 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 what was the other one called? Uh, your pattern key. And so you have a lot more options with that. That's fundamentally the difference. Are you going to add anything to that, Gary? Sure. I, I always like to describe it this way. The upstream keys are generally what we consider part of your program. So your program might have picture in picture, it might have titles, uh, labels, things like that, um, and other graphics that are important to the actual program. Uh, the downstream keys could be considered um, a addition to the program. So like if you're doing like a live news show, the downstream key could be carrying bugs and crawls with uh, weather and, and time and other logos and things like that. It allows you to separate what you consider part of the program with the overall output stream. So uh, we also provide the ability for you to capture the program ahead of the downstream keyers using the uh, clean feeds. So uh, you can certainly use them for any way you want, but basically if you, can, if you would like to separate something that's time of day from the actual program, that's how you would do that. You'd put that in the downstream key uh, and the upstream keys would be your program. Thank you kindly, awesome. We are going to have a little bit of extra time. This is actually going faster than it usually does, which is always surprising to me. And um, so we're going to have some time at the end. So we are going to spend some time talking about this setup as a whole. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll grab one of these cameras off the tripod and just show you kind of the ridiculousness of this setup because it's just kind of fun. And then I will talk about the Stream Deck and utilizing... Um, companion because I think that is extremely, extremely interesting for a lot of people and how you can tie this in and really bring things to the next level as far as your whole live operation goes, especially if you're a solo operator right? like I am here. There's nobody switching cameras for me. I'm doing everything. And so I just have these buttons so I can do all these different things from here, but I have a lot of stuff tied into that. Some of which I break sometimes, but what are you going to do? All right.
let's move on. So next up is, get the right slide up here, moving on to media player. So the media player, this is kind of a quick one because it's not a whole lot to talk about in here, but the media player is where you load up the media that you want to play. It's a very complex. Let's look at it. Over here on the software control, let's go over to the media tab. So again, that's down here at the bottom, switch to the media tab. And you have in here a variety of little media slots. These are also called a still store, like it stores your stills, your little stills, and these are storage places for it. These are it's generally, well, first of all, it's generally a better idea if you load in a graphic that is the size of your program. So this ATEM is 1920 by 1080. So I want to make sure my graphics are loaded at that. That way I get no pillar boxing. It won't distort the picture, but if you don't have the right size, you'll get pillar boxing or letter boxing. And um, if it's a low resolution, it's going to fill the screen. So it's not going to look as good. It just, or if it's bigger, it's going to have to scale it down just make the graphics at the right size. So my graphics that are, well, the graphics that you see on here, these little temporary silly things, those are all 1920 by 1080. But if we switch over to my bigger ATEM, those are all actually 4K because it is a 4K switcher. And so all of these graphics that are now gonna have to load up um, are done in 4K. So I actually don't really have to wait for these. Let's just go back to the other one. Just one of those little tips. So anyway, back in here, you've got in here your, um, your different graphics, see these are loading a lot faster because they're only HD. So these are the graphics we can load in here. These can have transparency. So we talked a little bit about that, that before, and I will just reiterate that again. While it is technically possible to go into any graphics app and just create a PNG with you know your drop shot or transparency and everything else, anything that's a simple transparency, hard edge transparency is gonna look perfectly fine. But if you start doing fancy things like drop shadows or you've got like a fading you know blue that fades to transparency, that kind of a thing, it's not going to look right unless you make a pre-multiplied key. So again, I've got a video on that on YouTube. Just on YouTube, search Photo Joseph pre-multiplied key ATEM. You'll find the video, but it is really important to do them right to get the best possible look out of them. So just really, I want to reiterate that because it is very important. Other than that, when you, once you load the graphics in, you can load them in by navigating through your hard drive or you can simply just drag and drop them in from the desktop. This is how they look. And then when you want to bring one of those keys up onto the uh, into the media player you're just dragging it in so i say i want this one to be available for mp1 i want this one to be available for mp2 and if they do have transparency like this one here that is automatically handled you don't have to think about that it just happens in there another thing you can do is there's this capture still button and what this will do and this is only on the i'm actually i'm I don't know if this is on the Constellations. Gary, let me know if that's on the Constellations or not. It's on the A10 Mini, so it is not. Um, Gary's giving me a thumbs up, so that is on the Constellations. It's a newer feature. It doesn't exist on my primary hardware, my my A10 2, my older A10 2 ME. Um, but it's a cool little feature where it will grab. Let's, see, let's go back to the multi view. It'll grab whatever is in the program. So you can see the program now. It's this super source, right? So let me go back to this view here, and I'm just going to hit capture still. And you see it automatically loading up there and then boom, there it is. So that has just loaded up there just like that. And it's just a still that you can grab. So this can be really effective if you need to quickly get something off of air um, or you know that you're, something's about to happen and you wanna grab a still of what it is to hold that as kind of a freeze frame or I don't know, any other number of reasons. There's just something really cool happening and you wanna grab a still of it for memory. You can do that. Now, the way that you get that, if you want that out of your computer, you can't just drag and drop it out. There is, uh, we're gonna talk about this more when we get into macros, but there is this option up here in the menus where you go save as, and this is going to bring up a dialogue here. Well, first I'll ask for a place, so I'll just hit test. Um, it's gonna ask you what you want to save. And within here, there's this thing called the media pool. And that media pool will save all the graphics that are in here, including ones that you generated out into a folder on your computer so that you can access all of those files. So if you do a still in there and you want to grab it, that is how you would go about grabbing that. Really not anything else to say about this. Uh, oh, I know, let's do, let's do talk about this. Let me go back into here again. If I, we looked at this a little bit before. So this is my program, right? So as I'm clicking any of these, whatever camera angle that is, is what goes on air. And you already saw the super source down there. MP1 and MP2 are media player one and media player two. So if I say I load up MP1, what is on MP1? Uh, let's bring in an actual something better. Okay, so that's MP1 right now. MP1 is now currently on air. If we look at this, we see MP1 is there on air. And if I, uh, yeah, I mean, that's really it. I, MP2, I can bring MP2 to air, same thing, right? So there's MP2 on air. 
If you want to change what is in MP1 and MP2, you can do that while it's on air. So right now, uh, Graphic 2 is on air, right? So if I go back to this view, so Graphic 2 is on air. I'm going to take the still, that capture that I did. So I'm going to take this guy here, and I'm going to drag that into here while it's on air. I'll go back to this, I'll drag it in while it's on air, and that will instantly load into that position. So you can very quickly call up different graphics, and you can actually do that via macros as well. So you don't have to drag and drop it. You can have a macro that says load graphic number 13 into media store one and one button push and that's going to do it. That's largely how I do, uh, like when I go to the pre-show or the break or lunch or all those, I have different graphics loaded up for those. Those presets are just pulling up the, the appropriate graphic and loading it onto air. So I don't have to manually drag that in. So even though you only have two media players, you have, in this case, you have 20 still stores. I think the larger ones can go up to 40 still stores, and so you can have a lot of graphics loaded into there. And that's kind of all there is to say about media players. You know what, since we have time, let's talk a little bit more about the, was it in the preferences? No, let's talk a little bit more about the HyperDeck control. So let's, uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna switch over to my other ATEM where the HyperDeck is already set up and show you how that works in there because that'll be a little bit easier to see because it's already in place. All right, so here you can see under my HyperDeck controls, so now we're looking at the, the bigger ATEM, the 4K ATEM. There's my HyperDeck controls and you can see that I have IP addresses for all the HyperDecks. Little green check marks there is telling me that that is valid, it's a valid connection. So uh, I've cleverly numbered my IP addresses to match the numbers on the HyperDex to make my life a little bit easier. So um, I've got HyperDeck number one, two, five, and six. Yes, I have six HyperDex in my rack. Don't ask. Um, so I can connect, I can control any of those from here. So since we're talking about media players, this allows me to play any of those graphics. So let's go up here. So at the top here, you got this media player tab. Go to the media player tab. And here there's, um, it's kind of, this is a little bit kind of confusing because it, it looks like there's play buttons in here even though you can't load videos in. And Gary, tell me, is there some ATEM, maybe the Constellation that can actually load videos in? I've never really understood why there's play buttons in here when I can only load a graphic. But anyway, I can choose in Media Player to be you know, any of those stills in here, right? This one, see, this ATEM has up to 32 stills. Or forget about the media player, let's just go to the HyperDeck. So we can see here, my four HyperDecks, this one that's connected is actively recording. This is recording this live show, so I don't wanna mess with that. But I can go over to this one, and this is my HyperDeck that is set up to playback video. So if I look here, there's a little thing that says there's seven clips on here, and I open this guy up, and I can see all the clips that are on here. So these clips can be played by simply double-clicking on one of these, and it will start playing that out. Um, or I can queue it up as part of a macro. So if I wanted to, as I was explaining earlier, I can write a macro that plays, you know, video number five or whatever. In fact, when I bring up Gary and me together, that animated blue background is a video that's playing off of that HyperDeck. And that is this little video right here, it says uh, animated background one. So that little animation, a little 49 second looping animation is playing on there. And when I want it to play as a loop, I just enable that little loop thing and it'll just play that um, you know, forever, um, as, long as, uh, as, as long as I wanted to. So that's how these little things work. And then you can actually scrub through them as well. So I can use this to preview something. I can scrub through and bring up, uh, say I've got a clip on there, a longer clip, I wanna find the right part. I can scrub through that, get it ready, queue it up in the preview and then hit play and off it goes. So yeah, really pretty cool there. You have this kind of control in there that you can do that, um, do that with. Let me just check something here real quick. Uh, no, nope, that's not it. Nope. Anyway, so that kind of control over the HyperDex is fantastic to have. Again, having the control directly in the ATEM software is great, but really building macros in is where that really that really starts to starts to sing. Um, and like I said, you can even control recording from there. Like I am actually actively recording this program through that. Okay, I think that's really all there is to talk about with uh, media players. So next up we're gonna go to is audio, audio control. And for this, I've kind of set something up that I'm hoping is gonna work right. This will take a little bit of setup here, but I'm gonna use this A10 Mini. I've got a microphone plugged into here. Um, since now I figured out why I could barely hear it over there because my mic levels are set to line level. Give me a second, I'm gonna go grab my headphones so that I can listen to what I'm doing without, so I know what you're actually hearing. And what I will do is disable the mic that I'm currently talking through, my lapel mic. 
I'm going to enable this mic and just babble away and play with the settings and you'll see the kind of controls that we have in here. So we plug that into the headphone jack in there. Let me just make sure that is actually actively working. Yes, it is. Test, test. Excellent. Okay, so first let's take a look at the control panels before we actually start fiddling with buttons. Let's go back to this and we've got to switch to the right ATEM again. So connect over to the correct ATEM and go to the audio tab. Yes, let's start by just looking at it. So within here, you've got control over all of your input. So every input has its own set of Fairlight audio controls. And if you're not familiar with the term Fairlight, Fairlight is a software package that, as far as I know, was developed outside of Blackmagic. I believe they acquired it at some point. I'm pretty sure that's right. Fairlight, um, Gary's nodding his head, so excellent. Um, Fairlight is built into Resolve. I, it also, I think is also still operating as a standalone app, but as part of Resolve is a whole Fairlight page that you have just insane audio control. A bunch of the Fairlight technology is built into this hardware. And so you can do your EQing, your gating, all these cool things directly in the hardware. And you have these controls on every individual input. It's not a global setting for all of your inputs. So you can EQ and gate and compress each individual audio input. And the audio inputs are coming in on every video channel plus two dedicated audio inputs. And we see all of these if we look at the across the top of the list here. So there's uh, my 4K 60 camera says camera one, two, and three. And then there's, I don't have anything on four, five, six, seven, and eight. So they're just labeled as that. And then there's mic one and mic two. And those are the ports that are back here where I now have one of these mics plugged into. So all these separate controls. So if you think about audio and how you can run audio on the ATEM, you really have a lot of options. You can, at its simplest, just plug a microphone into one or two of your cameras, bring the audio in and off you go. So let's say, let's let's do a, Let's do this. Let's run through a few scenarios and start with the most basic. Me on camera, right? It's like a show like this, but let's you know, pull out simpler. A um, couple of cameras. I'm going to have one camera that's a you know, uh, front shot, and then maybe I have another one that's kind of a side shot, and maybe an overhead or whatever. I only need one microphone. It's just me here. So I could either get a lavalier mic like I'm using now, wired or wireless, and plug that into camera one, or get a boom mic or a shotgun mic and plug that into camera one. Camera two and three, they have audio technically because they have microphones on them, but I don't want that audio because that's terrible audio. So I'm going to make sure that I'm not using that audio, but I am using the audio that's coming in on camera one. Or I could take that audio and instead of routing it through the camera, I could route it into the ATEM itself. Now I'll tell you that it is highly advisable to route your audio through the camera for almost every camera that you buy out there because Cameras, HDMI cameras inherently have a delay between what goes into the camera, the real world, and what comes out over HDMI. And it might be very slight, might be only a frame or so, but it might be quite a lot. It might be, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 frames. If it's 10 frames, that's a third of a second on a 30 frame per second timeline. So that 10 frame delay is very noticeable. And then you get what happens when we have Gary on camera here and he is not in sync. And I, I don't know why I fix that, but you get that out of sync thing. So you clearly don't want that. If you run your audio through the camera, then the audio and the video are processed together and sent back out together in sync. And so you can't have any sync issues when you're running your audio through the camera. Some cameras, again, have a low enough uh, delay that it's imperceptible, but it is still advisable to do it that way. If, however, you decide you're gonna run your audio directly into the ATEM on the mic input, and whether that means a single microphone like this, or you've got a huge mixing console and you're routing the audio in, if you're on a big mixing console, odds are it's going to have a delay program built into it, so you can program a delay on it, or you can actually program delay on the mic inputs in the ATEM software. So if you are running your audio into here, you can do that. You can delay the audio to bring it in sync with the video. How do you bring it in sync? Uh, you can do something as simple as a clap test and just looking at it. I actually generated a series of test files a couple of years ago. They're, um, they're free to download. Let me think about this. I'm pretty sure the URL, Gary, test this out for me and let me know if this is the right URL. So photojoseph.com slash AV, audio video, AV sync test. I'm pretty sure that's the URL. It'll redirect you to that page. And from there, you can download video files in 2398, 24, 25, 2997, and 5994. I think that's all of them. And you can use those to do a sync test. And the way that, okay, that is the correct URL. So photojoseph.com slash AV sync test. Gary, do me a favor and type that into the chat for everybody. And um, 
<clears throat> pardon me. And what you do is you load that video onto a device like an iPad or a laptop screen, whatever. And you crank up the volume on it and you point that at your point your camera at it and you hit play with your microphone, obviously, and you record a few seconds of video. And what, what you're seeing on this video file is a little ball that's running across the bottom of the screen. And when it hits zero and sync, it beeps. So it goes beep, beep, beep. And then when you look at the video file, you see on the timeline the beep, the spike of the beep on the audio time. And then you see on the video where it is. So it's, you go, oh, look, it's off by three frames. Now I need to know that I need to build three frames of delay. And there's also a calculator on there. If you need it by time, it'll tell you how much time that is at any given frame rate. And then you just type that into your ATEM software or into your program, <clears throat> excuse me, program that, program that into your hardware audio interface. Lots of different ways to go about it, but it's, it's a pretty slick thing to do. So let me show you where that is in here. If you are dealing with a delay, you'll see that right here. So under mic one and two, there's this little arrow button on there. If I click on that, it brings up mic input settings and delay, and I can delay that up to eight frames of delay in there. You'll notice that you only have that on the, um, oops, you only have that on the mic one and two. You don't have the delay across the other inputs in there because there's no need to, because those are gonna be in sync automatically. Then under each, each one of these, you have a gain control. So your gain is always gonna start at zero as your default. That's your default position. You can gain it up to plus six or gain it all the way down to, well, it's silent, but to down to minus so 60, 70, how does it go, 80? It goes high, 90, it goes basically up to 100. So you can gain it all the way down. So if you have some really, really hot mic coming in, you can pull that down. Then we'll, we'll come back to all this stuff. Then underneath that, you have your fader. So if you think about the difference between your gain and your fader, uh, an optimal idea on how to set this up would be to set your gain, set your fader at zero. So we can go here, type zero, excuse me, and there we have our kind of default neutral position. All right, so that's at plus zero. With that at plus zero, I then go up to my gain and I start adjusting the gain until the levels look good. So I get somebody on my talk, 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 get the gain adjusted right. Now I don't want to mess with the gain during the live show, but the fader, which is easier to grab, right? It's a, a much bigger slider, easier to grab and to grab and make new, small nuance changes. That's when the talent suddenly gets a little bit quieter, a little bit louder, or just I just need to do a little bit more balancing to mix everybody in. But get your gain set for each microphone first, and then make fine tuning adjustments with the faders. <clears throat> There's probably some audio go out there who's gonna tell me I'm totally doing it wrong, but that's the way I've always understood it. That's the way I've always done it. I am not an audio expert, but there you go. Um, so with that said, those are your two level controls in there. Then at the bottom of this, you also have a pan control. If you're dealing with stereo audio, you can do that. But in between these are these two little things that don't look like they're whole much, but oh my goodness, you click on one of these and look at what happens. So this one is the equalizer. And you have a full parametric EQ in here that you can really tweak what the voice sounds like. So you've got incredible control in here. I understand about 5% of all this, but you have an immense amount of control across your audio sound. So that's an awesome thing in there. Let me just reset that. And then underneath that, and if you're a Resolve user, this will look familiar. Underneath that, you have your dynamics panel. And in your dynamics, you have an expander and a gate. So this is gonna allow you to, uh, to cut off certain levels. So if, you're, if you've got a lot of background noise, you can cut off a certain frequency of background noise. The problem with gates is that if you have a lot of background noise and you make the gate too high, then when someone's not talking, it's perfectly silent. And then when they start talking, you hear them and you hear the background hiss and it gets a bit disjointed. You're like, it's like someone keeps unplugging their mic. It's a bit too harsh. So finding that balance is key in doing that so that it takes out some of the background, but it's not so obvious that it's, um, that it is a jarring. Also, if your gate is too strong, then when they start talking, the gate has to activate. And so it's basically like literally like a gate opening and closing. It has to open to allow the voice to come through. And you can end up with a weird kind of sound at the beginning of everybody talk, every time somebody talks. So, you know, use with, with caution. Uh, don't think, oh my God, I can completely eliminate all my background noise with the gate. This is perfect. You're only eliminating the background noise when you're not talking. So, you know, use judiciously. Um, anyway, then you have compressors. So a compressor is all about, I guess I should show it. <clears throat> Excuse me, a compressor here. So there's my expander gate compressor. Compressor is all about taking your, your dialogue levels and making them, making your quieter and your louder parts more similar. Trying to kind of, if you think about it, if you're looking at a waveform, you've got, 
you got spikes all over the place like this, trying to kind of pull them in, not just quiet everything, but squish them together so that your quiets and your louds are more similar to each other. So that as people are talking and they go a little quiet and they go a little louder and they go a little quiet, go a little louder, it's not as jarring, it's not as different, and it just sounds better overall throughout the, um, uh, throughout the program. And then you've got oh, a limiter. So limiters are super important as well to ensure that people aren't spiking, aren't peaking, aren't blasting out their audio. So someone suddenly starts shouting into the mic, it doesn't clip, they get cut off at a certain point and their audio is kept below a certain level. So all of this is built into here. And again, on every single individual input, including the mic inputs on their own, which again, I'll remind you, as we saw in the beginning settings, those inputs can be set to line level, mic level, or mic level with power. Excuse me one second here. I gotta little frog in my throat wanted to rivet its way out of there. Okay, um, let's see. So there are your audio controls in there. So now let's actually hear these in play. I oh, I forgot headphones. So the ATEM minis, and oh, actually this is kind of funny. I have not looked. Is there a headphone jack on the Constellation? There is not. It's so funny. It's such, a, maybe there's one on the front, hold on. It's such a powerful feature to have the ATEM, have uh, headphones. No, no headphone jack on there. Gary, what's that all about? No headphone jack. Oh, I got my menus on here. Let's get that off. There we go. Um, the headphone jack is just a really nice, easy way to be able to monitor your audio. I guess on the bigger ATEMs, it's considered less important because you're always going to have some kind of a monitor hooked up to it to watch your program, and you can hear through that monitor. So you can plug your headphones into the monitor. But on the ATEM Mini Extremes, only on the Extremes, you have a direct headphone jack on here, which is such a great feature. It's so nice to be able to plug in headphones and just hear what's happening directly in the hardware here without having to go through a monitor or anything else. Now, what you're actually hearing through there is controlled down here. So I have a solo button. So this will allow me to hear just that one channel. Or if I turn them off, then I'm going to hear all the channels. Over here, I have a headphones levels control. You can also mute the headphones. So you don't have to take them off if you want to. And by the way, these controls in here can largely be controlled on the hardware as well. So here's my headphone controls. There's a mute, reset, and up and down on here. I'm going to click the mute button in software and you can see it lighting up in the hardware as well. Same thing if I wanted to bring the levels up or down. So I'm pushing them on here. Now let me switch over to the software view and you can see as I'm pushing them, we're seeing the sliders move in there as well. So you have that hardware control directly on there or you can do it via the software. Okay, so there's your headphones. Now let's actually listen to it. So um, here's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I get this right and don't blast anybody out. So let me make sure that my levels are correct and we're at the right switcher. Yep, okay. Talk, talk, test, test. Um, turn that is on. Mic one, okay, that's a little bit hot. So I'm gonna bring that down. Oh, I've got it at plus 20. Let's see here. So I wanna make sure I don't hurt anybody. Okay, yep, that's good. All right, now I am going to mute my mic, mute my lavalier mic, and bring in the audio from this. So it'll take me a moment, but we'll get this piped in properly. Check, 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 check. All right. It's, ooh, it's hot. Let's bring that down. Test, 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 test. Looking at my levels on here. It's a little bit on the low side. I'm looking at a lift meter in front of me here so I can see. Okay, there's, there's good levels. All right. So now... Oh, with any luck, you're hearing that. Let me put my headphones on here so I can hear myself. Check, check, check. There we go. Oh, that does sound good. Nice and rich. Nice and deep. Good mic. Okay. So now that I've got that there, that is on mic one. I'm going to switch up over to the software, and you can still obviously hear what's happening in here. And so there's the levels that I was playing with. So I can get those levels a little louder, a little quieter. But let's get into the let's get into the EQ. So let's start with the EQ. I'm just going to keep on babbling away while I make these changes to here. And you can see that I can really boost up the bass in there if I wanted to on my voice or pull that out if there's a little bit too much bottom end in there. Maybe I want to pull up the treble a little bit, make it a little bit brighter. I can do that. And you can see it starts to get a little bit flat and tinny if I totally do that wrong. But I might want to boost up my mids a little bit um, or maybe pull them out. Maybe I got some like kind of weird thing in my voice. I want to pull that out of there. Let's add some of that bass back in there because I like that really boomy radio voice on there so I can get that going. You have all kinds of fun controls in here that we can do directly in the software on each individual channel. And let's go into the gates in here, the dynamics, and let's see what we can do with the dynamics. So if I do the gate, well, actually this should be a pretty good demo. I'm going to take, okay, hold on. I gotta, now I got to take this out of my ear and get both, both cans on so I can really hear what's happening. Oh yeah, there's a good amount of background noise in here. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so now let's go back and activate the gate. 
and see if I can find what am I looking for a threshold so now as I start talking you can see when I'm not talking there we go so now when I'm not talking it's totally silent but you can hear that when I do start talking there's that weird cutoff and when I stop or cut in and then the weird cut off so this is definitely overdoing the gate but that's the kind of thing that you can do in here so again it's all about it's all about understanding how it works which I do very little but it is incredibly powerful let's go to the expander I think if I do the expander I might get a little bit better result off of that yeah I'm totally messing this up anyway you get the idea someone who knows a lot more about audio than me uh, could show you how to actually use this but my role here is just to show you that it is there it is available and it is very very cool okay uh let's turn this off turn that one back on i believe yep i'm on there we go i gotta tell you having i've got this fairly new toy in here it's this tc electronics so where's my close-up camera can i get it yeah oh that's kind of almost oh, the cables aren't that long there we go you can kind of see, okay there you go you can see the it's a lufts meter which is a measure of audio over time, and I can see where my levels are, and it's just this nice piece of hardware. It's the TC Electronic Clarity M Stereo. It's a fantastic little addition to the setup. Um, and side note on that, super cool, is that it will operate with your NLE. There's a plug-in that will go you know, in Resolve, and I think it works in Final Cut and Premiere as well, but it, Access with a plug-in for your NLE, so you hood it, put it at the very end of your chain, and you can see the levels of your dialogue or whatever in your video that you're editing um, while you're mastering your audio. It's just, it's so cool to have. Anyway, side note there. Okay, backwards. So there's there's your audio. That's what I wanted to show you in audio. Let's get this stuff out of the way. It's taking up space on my desk. Um, and that is the audio tab. Uh, Gary, do we have any questions? Let's switch over to you for a moment while I put this away and see if you've got any questions. Okay. Uh, basically, what I wanted to offer was with the Fairlight audio section in all of our new ATEM switchers, um, it can be quite complex and daunting if you don't understand all the controls. Uh, in the manual, there is a short section that describes everything that will at least give you a good start as to how to use everything. Um, uh, of course, sitting down and playing with everything certainly helps, and it's quite easy to zero things back to normal, so that, that does help. But um, definitely a, worth a read in the manual. Yeah, I would say audio, when it comes to audio, for me personally, that is my weakest link. It is so, and I've spent so much time on it, but somehow it's it's hard. I don't know why. Video to me is way easier than audio. Audio is just, nah. but I know there's people who are reversed on that. They're like, oh, audio is easy. What are you talking about? Video is hard. Right? Well, there you go. Okay. Anyway, thank you for that. Were there any uh, questions that had come up? As a side note here, somebody just popped up. Bart, are you uh, rechargeable batteries 1.2 volts by any chance? I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. What are these? Gentleman probably has an answer to your problem. Well, that'd be great. These are these are 1.2 volts. Is that bad? They're 2,800 milliamp, 1.2 volts. That may not be high enough, I suppose, to run the. What is a standard double A? Look. Standard, standard, standard. Yeah, the the non rechargeables are one point five, and it's probably better to use those. You're right. The one more non rechargeable is one point five. This one's one point two. Huh? I never knew that. Well, there you go. I hate buying batteries, though. It's like this just it makes me sad to have to buy non rechargeable batteries. Um, okay, good to know. Thank you very much. All right, let me put this back. And uh, I guess thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. I guess I have more non-rechargeable batteries in my future. Or, you know what? I've got these other weird things that look like double A's, but they're specifically for my follow focus control system. I think they're a little bit bigger. Oh, 3.7 volts. Those are probably blow it up. Let's not plug those in. I think they're just a little bit fatter as well. Yeah, let's probably not put that in. Okay, anyway, so uh, I guess no questions. Thank you very much for that insight into battery power. Yeah, I have some more questions. Oh, good. Okay. So uh, one was related to um, basically the media pool and playing back videos. Um, you'll notice that, that when you were talking about uh, the media players being able to play back videos, remember that the larger ATEMs have a clip store 
in there for stingers and things like that. So that's where you would have control over the, the media the media players in the in the widget there. Um, the question relates to um, uh, can the uh, media player play back multiple videos? Uh, can they take the videos and play them back to back? Um, or do we need external hardware? And I'm pretty sure we know the answer to this. Um, but basically, they, what they want to do is play back uh, several videos or one video uh, back to back or one by one. Right. So any kind of video playback does require external hardware. So that can be at, at the kind of top level, you'd get a hyperdeck because that gives you the control like we saw in the software of within the ATEM choosing which clip you want to play, if you want to loop it or just go to the next one. Um, you could build macros that say play clip number one and then play clip number 12 and so on. But if you want to, if you're doing a kind of bargain basement, you want to not spend any extra money on it. Anything can plug into the ATEM, anything with an HDMI out that can play video. So you can use a laptop, you can use a, an iPad. And actually, I think using an iPad is a really effective way to do it because you can, if you use a computer, you're going to be mirroring the screen, which means you're going to potentially have your mouse in there. You see the play controls while, you know, after you click play, you get away from to fade away or you're dragging that window over to a second monitor that's inside of the, that is the ATEM. And, um, and again, trying to not get the mouse in there and so on and so on. If you use an iPad though, iPad just from the Photos app, you load your videos into there, you don't see any of that. So on the iPad, you'll see as you scrub through to choose what video you want and then hit play and it'll just play full screen. So that's a really effective way to do it. If you already have an iPad, then that is a great way to play videos through the ATEM. But the best way to do it, to be able to control it from the ATEM itself, is with the HyperDeck. And there's a, a whole lineup of them, I think. What's the HyperDeck shuttle? Isn't that like, what, what does that one cost, Gary? It's quite inexpensive now. Yes, I, the numbers escape me, but it's, it's pretty low. I'll, I'll pull it up while we're answering that while we're looking at the next question. Yeah, the HyperDeck shuttle is the least expensive HyperDeck. It's new. It was released at NAB this year. And... Uh, yeah, it's a really cool little little device for playing back video that is designed specifically to go with the A10 minis. It doesn't do the key and fill that I was talking about earlier for, that the bigger ones do. Oh, look, Gary's got one right there. Um, but it's a great little piece of hardware. So well, let's find it here while you're, while you're doing the next question. Okay, so another question relates to um, uh, analog audio. Um, how do you transform to mono audio uh, on a, t a tip ring sleeve input on the Constellation? So I, I think the question is basically they're feeding maybe mono audio on one channel, uh, but they want to get it into both channels. Was that the question? Yeah, maybe if, if the questioner could clarify the question, that would be awesome. Um, let me here. I found the the HyperDeck shuttle on the website, but I don't see the price on here. I'll go to BNH and see. This is pretty cool. Let me let me just go to the BNH website because I'm not finding it on here. HyperDeck, oops, HyperDeck shuttle. It is ah, BNH. Four ninety five. So here's the here it is. So this is the HyperDeck shuttle. It's four ninety five. And if we look at the Blackmagic website, um, scroll up to the top here. You see more of what it looks like. So it's designed to go with the A10 Mini. I mean, it has network control, right? Just like that. It has your HDMI out and an HDMI input. I'm not sure what the HDMI input is for. Interesting. I don't have one. I've never played with one. Um, but it's a neat little little device. Yep, very, very cool. And again, easy way to play video that you uh, want to queue up on your uh, to play back on your system. Oh, and you can record in here as well. Oh, I guess the input would be you could take an output from your ATEM, feed it into the input, and then use this to capture that video. Okay, cool. Neat. All kinds of fun things. All right. Uh, anything else, Mr. Gary? I, I think I might um, understand the, the mono question. Um, what commonly happens is that people will have like a mono uh, balanced audio, you know, like one channel of audio, either from a microphone or something that's already at line level. Uh, and they want to feed it into the the tip ring sleeve and put in the constellation, which is a which is also a um, a mono input basically. So um, I, I think that's what it is. Um, basically, that is maybe I misunderstood that. So maybe we we need clarification. But basically, um, you know, the tip ring sleeve input on the constellation is a mono input. There's two of them, one for left and one for right, and it's balanced analog audio. If you're only feeding one audio channel into the Constellation, you can split the channels in the software 
and take the left channel and then pan it over into both channels, if that's what you're uh, basically asking. Yeah, and I'm going to show the ATEM setup, if it will load, where'd it go? That um, where you do have those, those kind of stereo setups in there as well. Let's see here, uh, we go to the extreme, because there's a little bit of audio control in here that might be useful for, to answer their question. If I can find it, there it is. Uh, oh no, that's not in here, it's not in the setup. Where's the audio settings? I'll go back into, sorry, I'm gonna go back into the, oh, I'm looking at the wrong ATEM, that's why I couldn't find them. Allow me to switch over to the ISO, which has these controls, there we go. Audio, split audio, okay, so if we look at the, this is the um, controls in the ATEM itself under the audio tab, so you have split audio, so you can choose, you know, input one, do I want to split that out into two? And if I move this over, there we go. So there's input one, you see now it's got a left and right. So if you're only bringing something in off of one channel, or if you had separate audio coming in left and right, you can adjust those uniquely here. So you can separate that out for each of the, well, for the first four, no, oh, for all of them, for all eight inputs. Um, and for the mic. So the mic can be set up that way as well. So your mic becomes a stereo input. Oh. I don't know if that's what they're asking for, but between all that information, hopefully that has given them all the possible information they need to find their answer. And by all means, if you, st if you want to clarify it, go ahead. Then you can um, pan one channel into the other. So the control at the very bottom of the mixer there will be a pan control when they're in the split mode. When they're in the stereo mode, the control at the bottom is a balance control. All right, so that means that next up is camera control. How do we control the cameras? So this is where we get into specifically the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras. Technically, you can do this with some of the other bigger broadcast cameras as well. It requires extra hardware. We're just going to base this off of the BMPCC cameras. So there's two of them. There's the 4K and the 6K. They both have the same level of control in there. And... Um, and then, uh, and so, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Also, well, you know what? I want to mention, if you are using these cameras, because I had a, an issue getting the 6K set up yesterday, a lot, and I've, I've seen this comment a lot. I don't use the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras with the A10 Mini, other, pretty much other than for these demos. So it took me a while to figure this out. A lot of people run into, when you first plug in the camera, you are getting a 17 by 9, not a 16 by 9 image. So when you pull up the feed, you are seeing a black bar across the top and the bottom instead of seeing a um, instead of seeing a full you know full height image, and if you look at the back of the camera and you go into the settings, you can choose a variety of 17 by 9 um, or 23 239 aspect ratios in there that you can choose from, but none of the two 16 by 9 ones HD and Ultra HD are grayed out. You can't actually get to them. Why? Turns out. The top resolution, this is specifically for the 6K, the top resolution, the 6K resolution, that is a 16 by 9 layout, even though it doesn't say 16 by 9 on it. And that's the, like, that's the gotcha. It doesn't say 16 by 9, so you don't think that, and it's a, I forget how many pixels Y, but you don't look at it and go, oh, that math becomes 16 by 9. <laughs> no, and that's 1.778. No, you don't know. You're just looking at some numbers. But if you choose that one, then the aspect ratio is 16 by 9, and the camera will be recording to 6K raw internally. So full 16 by 9, but at 6K, while it's outputting 16 by 9 at HD. So that's the answer to that. If you plug in your BMPCC 6K, and you're getting the black bars, and you're looking at your settings going, why are the two 16 by 9 HD and Ultra HD grayed out? You got to go to the 6K, to the very top one. That's why. Okay, so I only mentioned that because it bit me yesterday. I was trying to figure it out and finally got it. Okay, so let's look at camera control. Um, the camera's first physical connection is just one HDMI cable. That's it. So you can see, you know, the HDMI cable's coming in here. One's plugged into each camera. You can see it kind of trailing out the side there. That's it. Remember in the beginning, I explained that HDMI is a bi-directional communication path, communication cable. So the ATEM can send a signal to the camera and vice versa. That is what allows us to control the camera and is what allows us to have uh, the tally lights on the camera, which is really cool, which I can't really show you, but just trust me, there's a green little tally light on it. Um, another little thing I wanted to tell you too, kind of a, a, a tip if you run into an issue. If you've ever plugged in your cameras, you got a bunch of stuff plugged into your ATEM and you've lost camera control. My camera's working, you got the signal, but you cannot control the camera. What I've found is that some cheap hardware devices that you might plug in, such as a little video player. I have this little 
like a $50 HDMI video player that um, is cool. This is an easy way to play video onto an ATEM or something. But when I plug that in, something about its HDMI signal is interrupting the output on all ports. And so if you find that you've plugged in your cameras and you no longer have camera control, look at what else is on the chain, look at what else is plugged in, and unplug devices one at a time. And actually just, I would start by unplugging everything except for the cameras, reboot, make sure that you got control, and then start plugging the things in one at a time. Um, it might sometimes come down to just the order in which you plug things in, but just know that there are, there is hardware out there, there are devices out there that will interrupt the stream Obviously not hardware from Black Magic, some you know, cheap third-party junk, but you plug something in and it does that, uh, it could happen. So just a little, little, little bit of warning in there. Gary's got, Gary's raising his hand. Yes, basically to further explain how that works, that we use uh, the CEC or Con Consumer Electronics Communication Bus to communicate with the cameras. And all of the buses are on the same, they're all connected together at the ATEM. So if, um, some other device, like third-party cameras and things like that, um, take control over that bus, then we lose control. Uh, one good example is the, the, um, the DisplayPort adapter out of a Mac. If you go DisplayPort to HDMI into the switcher, the DisplayPort will swap out the uh, CEC bus and we won't have control. So it's, there's a variety of devices that can cause this to happen. And as it turns out, on uh, uh, it, it is available. They make what they call CEC killers. It's just a little HDMI device that um, takes HDMI in and out, and it will block that. So if you had one or two of those lying around, all you have to do is stick that in the line of the device that's causing the problem, and um, and everything should work then. Oh, excellent! I never knew that. Okay, now we got two things I have to buy after this show. Cool. Thanks, Gary. Every time I talk to Gary, I end up spending money. God, yeah, how it goes. Okay, so uh, is that all the caveats I wanted to get? So how to get your 16 by 9 image, how to control it, what to do if you're getting blocked. I think that sounds good. Now let's actually look at the control. So let's start with the, am I on the right? Ex uh, yes, on the extreme ISO, go to the camera control. And let's just start with a tour of the settings in here. And then we'll actually look at it in action on, um, on the camera. So let me get some, a couple of things set up here. And we're good to go. Okay, so here we've got, first of all, you see all the same listings of your cameras. This is the 4K, the 6K, my iPad, and so on. Um, you can shortcut to these across the top in here, which seems silly when there's only a few of them on here, but when you have a 40 inputs, suddenly this little row of little mini buttons here becomes very handy. It allows you to jump quickly to one of those. Clicking on any setting in here is not bringing that camera to air, by the way. You notice that the 4K is currently on air. So if I go to this view, we can see the 4K is on air. Um, in fact, I'm going to bring the 6K into the preview just to, there we go. Uh, six, I lied, there we go. So now I've got both cameras back up in the preview in the program. And if I go back over to the camera software, we see which one is on air. It doesn't bother to show us which one's in the preview here. Um, but it just shows us which one is on air. And the reason for this is because you don't want to go, oh, I'm going to make some changes to the camera setting. I wonder what's going to happen if I do this. Like, no, guy, don't do that. You're on air right now. So that's what that is. It's not allowing you to actually switch what is on air. It's just warning you that that one is on air. Um, there's a little lock button in there, so you can lock it even. You say, look, I can't make a change while it is on air. Anyhow, so from here, you have a whole variety of controls. Lift, gamma, and gain for your exposure controls. Color, to push color in any number of directions. You have a uh, sharpness, kind of a, a software sharpening uh, from default up to high detail. I will tell you that if you crank it up to the high detail and you're doing an HD output, it's going to look garbage, so don't do that. Use this with caution. You have a little reset button over here that will allow you to reset individual pieces or everything, or copy. So this is really useful if you need to copy the settings from one camera to another. You know, you got one dialed in, you can copy and then paste that to the other, or even there's a paste all command. So I can, you know, you know, copy that setting and then go back in here and say paste to all cameras, pretty slick. And then here you have exposure controls. So your, uh, your gamma, your, your, yeah, I guess that's the gamma, and then your aperture. So sh yeah, gamma and the aperture is controlled through here. So this little dial -y. Then if you have a power zoom lens, you can control the zoom on here. I do not have a power zoom lens on these. So it's not gonna do anything. I actually did a whole video on that once because I had a power, a big, huge Canon power zoom lens in here once. So I did a video around it. You can totally control the zoom in there. Pretty cool. 
And uh, let's see here, this is the auto focus button, this is the manual focus button, and this allows you to have a maximum um, aperture so you don't overshoot your aperture when you're adjusting it. So with, now with all that set, oh, sorry, and then one more thing, if I click on this little expanded triangle here, that opens up to show for a single camera, separate lift gamma gain color controls. Also, you have your contrast, pivots, saturation, um, hue tint, a ton of stuff in here, Lumimix, all kinds of controls in here over your image. So how does this work in practice? Well, I, you're not gonna be able to see it while I'm looking at the screen, but let's go to, let's just bring this up on the program and I will start with the exposure. So I'm bringing the aperture down or opening it back up again. So we have that control. Um, I can change the color. So let's push a little bit of blue into my shadows in here. So kind of blue, there we go, blue up the shadows a little bit. I'm obviously going a bit extreme on here. Add some warmth into the highlights. Yeah, you know, you get some pretty cool looks in there. Um, I can do, so if I go back, I think I didn't show you this. Um, gain, so you, you're right, so you have, well, filter, that is ND filters. Some cameras have ND filters, these do not. Um, your gain, so that's basically your ISO, your shutter speed, and your white balance. So those can all be adjusted here as well. So again, if I go back to this view, and I play with, say, my white balance, I can turn the white balance down and cool the whole image. I can take the shutter speed and change that, which is obviously going to brighten or darken the image, and so on. And then there is the auto focus button. So this little guy down here. Oh, and the manual, well, yeah, the manual focus dial and the auto focus button. So let's go back to this. And if I grab that dial and move it, you'll see that I can manually adjust the focus on that camera. And if I hit the A, it is going to focus in the center. So you're going to want to get yourself or your subject, whatever, into the center. And boom, yeah, whoop, there it goes. And now we've got focus on the center. So all of that control happens through here, through that software interface, which is, again, pretty awesome to be able to do, to really be able to customize that look. If you are a DaVinci Resolve user, then a lot of these will feel familiar. It's a very similar layout to the color room in Resolve as far as the basic stuff, obviously not the you know, really expanded stuff you can do in Resolve, but this does give you a, a basic level of control over that. And again, as I was saying earlier as well, if you wanted to design a custom look, you could do that in Resolve or any NLE, but do that in Resolve and export a LUT, which you can then bring into your cameras and that you can bring into your Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras or any camera, right? Any camera that has, that supports log with a custom LUT in it, you could do the same thing and then have that custom look in there. And if you are doing, the raw recording in camera while having an output that is obviously pre-graded because you, you, know, you don't want to be live streaming a log stream, then you get the best of both worlds, right? You get that custom look for your live stream, but simultaneously you're capturing that log raw footage in the camera. And if you are using non-Blackmagic cameras, you can do the same thing. You just don't have the camera control, right? I can't do the camera control in here. I can't record in the cameras from the hardware itself but I can walk up to each camera, hit the record button and uh, have it record internally to ProRes or whatever it might do and then output a, um, a graded file, file with the LUT on it or just one of the built-in camera looks for you to do your live show with. So lots of options in there. But that's the camera control. Now um, I do, since we're talking camera control, let's take a look at the recording control in here. So if I was, uh, let's see here, go to output. If I was doing a live stream, and actually, no, I, should, I didn't really talk about this palette. I suppose we should talk about this. Let's, let's come back and talk about live streaming on here. But for recording, since we're talking about cameras, if I open this up, you'll see in here that I've got, well, you put a file name. It looks like I demoed this for NAB for some reason. I can call this the um, BMD ATEM demo. And I don't have drives connected, but there are two USB ports on the back of this that, uh, that the extremes have two USB ports. The mini ones have one USB port. I can plug in a hard drive in there, just like a little you know, USB Samsung T T5 kind of drive, plug it in there, and then that will show up in there. And then when I hit record, it's gonna to record to that drive. So you'll see on here, there's it says no drive connect because there isn't one, but I can also tick on record in all cameras and ISO record all inputs. These are options. You don't have to record everything if you don't want it. And the record in all cameras means that it, the when I hit record in the software, it's going to start recording in the cameras and, uh, and then I'll have that raw file, that BMD raw file to pull back. And again, that is only available on the Blackmagic cameras. Any other camera, that checkbox just isn't gonna do anything, so you have to go around and manually hit record on those cameras. Uh, yeah, that's that. Okay, since we're in here, and I neglected to talk about it earlier, let's just talk about the live streaming panel on here. So live streaming, from here you have a drop down. you can choose what platform you wanna to stream to. So you've got a ton of built-in, who when this first released, you had, I think, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube, or maybe in Twitter were the only ones, 
over time, a whole bunch more have been added. So you see there's a lot of different options here to live stream to. So let's say I wanted to stream to YouTube. I choose YouTube, uh, primary or secondary server. So you, within YouTube, if you don't know, you can actually stream a secondary backup stream to the same show, kind of handy. So you could do that from here if you needed to. And then you drop in your key from your YouTube show and you choose your streaming quality. You have a low, medium, and high, which I don't remember the bit rates off the top of my head, but they are you know, reasonable bit rates to be streaming over an internet connection. The faster your internet connection, the higher quality you can go. And there's your low, medium, high are meant for streaming. But you'll notice under here that there is, above that, there's what's called HyperDeck low, medium, and high. These are very high bit rate, not really designed to be streaming to uh, to the internet, but if you were streaming across a local network, you were streaming to a, uh, a streaming bridge, like what Gary's streaming to me, but remotely over the internet. If you were streaming to a streaming bridge that's on your local network, then you could choose one of those really high bitrate ones because you're all on a local LAN and, uh, and spit that off, which is pretty cool. So you have these little quality controls in there. And then as far as actually going live on air, once everything's set up, you just click the on air button and it takes you live. And you'll see... If you see uh, it starts flashing at you, then you know you've got a problem. If you hit on air and immediately it starts flashing, I get these questions a lot. If immediately it starts flashing, your ATEM is not talking to the internet. It does not have access to the internet, so you hit it and immediately it's failing. It goes, it can't stream, flash, 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 there's a problem. 99 of 100 times, it means that you do not have your ATEM configured to see the internet. So uh, that is, that's a network issue. So you gotta make sure that your, your ATEM is visible on the network and if you know, it should be easy, right? For most home or office networks, it's a DHCP device. So you just plug it into the network and it just shows up. If you can see the hardware on your computer over the network, not over USB, but over the network, you can see the switcher and your computer has access to the internet, then it should just work. If not, you don't know how to fix it, call your IT guy because it's out of, out, of, out of my hands. But that's almost always the problem is why that isn't working. If you start streaming and after a while, it starts to flash. And you'll see a little thing on there is a little buffer. Um, you'll see if the buffer starts filling up, then you know that you are streaming too fast. You're trying to push too much data and your internet bandwidth can't handle it. So you got to scale it down a little bit. You know, I've got, can I show this on? I can show this on screen. I have a camera angle that is almost going to point at it. Let me rearrange this camera. So I can show you the live stream that I am pointing to. Let's see, zoom out a little bit. Of course, you're going to get that cascading effect in there. Um, and I cannot tell at all from here whether it's focused or not. So give me a moment. I'm going to fix that. Um, and I want you to be able to see the live stream setup that I've got going through the Blackmagic web presenter. So it's a separate box, which gives me a lot more information. But it's kind of interesting to see. But give me a second here to set up that camera. Uh, this would be, actually, I'll show, you, I'll show you this too. This you might find fascinating. Um, we get this launched first and then I'll show it to you. So my camera system in the studio, I'm using uh, Lumix cameras, Lumix BGH1s, which actually I can control over the network. So I can't control them from the ATEM, but I can control them over the network. And so, why isn't my system connecting? I've got a PC, a little NUC PC, like a little Mac mini kind of thing, a little tiny PC in my rack that is connected to the cameras. Oh, there we go, now it's up. And, but something is wrong with the PC. It is not behaving properly. Give me control. Give me control. There we go. Okay. So, yeah. There's the computer. Um, I'm going to look at my shoulder camera here. And there we go. Let's get out of the way of this and let that focus. So, one shot, autofocus, and boom. Okay, there we go. So, now you can see that. Let's go back to the shoulder view and get out of its way. And so, you can see on here... There's this cache number. So ignore what's in the box here because that's where you're getting that cascading mirror effect. But you see a cache here and that is the buffer. And so my cache is only 3% full. So this is great. I'm streaming at 13 megabit, which is relatively low for 4K, but it's clearly working and it's allowing me to not have any issues on there. So this web presenter gives me a ton more information about the live stream, but it's a similar concept, similar idea when you are in the, uh, in the ATEM software looking at Come on, looking at the, uh, the the live streaming status. You just get not as quite as much information. All right, let me, my computer's starting to really slow down. I need to quit a couple of things. Let me quit that. Quit that, where did it go? Um, screen sharing thing. 
Okay. So let's see, is there anything else in there? I think that covers everything we'd want to talk about in there, streaming. So yeah, you click on air and off it goes. And like I said, you'll get a little errors flashing down there and you'll see the buffer fill up if that's the case. Um, recording stream we already talked about. Capture still we talked about. Capture video is only relevant if you've got a Ultra Studio or DeckLink card connected in. So we're definitely not getting into that today. And time code generator under here, it will run a time of day time code outputting to the camera. So this is essentially only useful if you are using the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras again, because it will output time of day time code to the camera. So all of your Blackmagic cameras have the same time code, which makes syncing things in post easier, especially if you're not going to use the, the uh, uh, resolve file that is generated by the ATEM. If you are just going to take those files and mix them up on your own, then having that time code sync on there can be super handy. So that is that. Anything else on cameras that I am leaving out? I think that is... Oh, I should show you the hardware control. So actually, if we go into the overhead view in here, you do have a level of hardware control over the cameras here. So it's the same kind of stuff you saw in there, obviously not as much, but you have gain focus, uh, black point, and your shutter angle control, and then you have these arrows. So if I go, let's, see, let's go to the camera that's on air, and let me bring this one up, there we go. And if I hit the gain button, so here, I'll, I'll do it like this. Let's go. So I push the gain button, it lights up, and now I have these arrows that are just going to allow me to adjust gain. So I'm doing this, and then I'll switch over, and you can see that it is adjusting the gain in there. Now I'll hit focus button, and I can manually adjust the focus in there. So is it changing? I'm going to hold it down. There we go. You can see it sort of starting to change in there. If you press and hold on the focus button, back into the center point, then after a few seconds, it triggers auto focus. So you do have those controls, some level of controls of your cameras from the hardware itself, which is pretty neat. Um, yeah, okay. I think it's everything to talk about for cameras. I feel like I'm missing something, but I mean, obviously there's a million things in the cameras themselves, but we're not getting into that. We're just talking about how they connect to the ATEM. I think we're good there. I think we're good there. Which leaves us with macros. That is our last big topic, which is going to leave us with time to go into other things. So uh, before we get into macros, let's see if there's any questions that uh, Gary has pulled up for me. I think we're good with questions right now. Okay. Alrighty, then let's get into macros. Macros is a big topic. So at its core, a macro is simply a recording of a sequence of steps. You hit record, and then you start doing things in the ATEM software, switching to a different camera angle, uh, adjusting a picture in picture, whatever. And all of those changes are recorded. Now, it's, there's a few things that are really, really important to know. Um, one kind of a simple thing is if you're adjusting, let's say you're positioning a, um, a picture in picture, right? You're moving it from here over to here. It is not going to record the actual movement. It's going to record the last position. So if you are recording a macro and you go in and you start messing around going, mm, move it here, move it here, move it here, move it here, and then you stop recording, it's not going to, when you play it back, it's not going to move your video and you do this. You're just going to see it immediately go to that position. If you wanted to make it record the movement, then you could, but that's not how it normally works. The other thing to know, and this is, this is super important to understand, and it can be daunting, is that and when I say this, it sounds really obvious at first, but as I explain deeper, you'll understand why it's not that obvious. When you're recording a macro, it only records what you tell it to record. You think, duh, obviously it's only going to record what I tell it to record. But here's what that means it doesn't record. It doesn't record anything you don't tell it to record. Which means, let's say real simple, and you've already seen this come up on my video here a couple of times. Let's say I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to go to this Gary and me, which has been triggered a couple of things, including a, um, including an upstream key. Now I'm going to trigger a macro or a shortcut that I've built in the stream deck. We'll talk about those later. That is going to go to my computer, which I'm pretty sure I did not explicitly tell it to turn off the upstream keys. No, oh, I did apparently. All right, let's see. Let me find one that I didn't tell it to. Uh, slides? No, I did. Built that into there. Apparently, I built this into more than I thought. Let's go to here. There we go. There's a good one. Okay, so I just brought up the extreme, uh, the, the multi view out of the extreme, but I didn't, when I built that button, I did not tell it to turn off the upstream keys. So now I've still got these upstream keys on there. Go back to my A camera, and in that shortcut, I did explicitly tell it to turn off the upstream keys so they go away. 
This is what it means to, that when I say that it records what you tell it to record, it doesn't record what you don't tell it to record. If you have, you've just, you're doing a thing, you're building a show and you put up this upstream key and you do a thing. And then you trigger a macro that is going to switch to camera one, just to make it really simple. But you have not in that macro told it to turn off the upstream keys, then the upstream keys will still be on. And what this effectively means is you, you don't have to go through and make sure that every single thing in your switcher is turned off that you don't want to be off. But it does mean that once you build your presets, you really need to practice your show. You need to go through all possible scenarios because if you don't, then very likely you're gonna hit one of your buttons that you thought, oh, well, I, I made a shortcut to switch to camera two and load this lower third. All right, good, that's fine, that's all I need to know. Well, it turns out that just before that you had loaded a different upstream key or a different downstream key and those don't go away. And now suddenly you've got all these layers of stuff happening on your picture that you weren't planning for. And you're live and now you're panicking, going, ah, I don't know, how do I turn that off? Where's this coming from? And all you gotta do is turn off that other thing, but you didn't remember to set that up. And so you're kind of panicking at that moment. So again, it only records what you tell it to, doesn't record what you don't. So when you're building your shortcuts, you're building your macros, really think through how they're going to be used. Okay, when I switch to camera one, is that all I'm doing is switching to camera one? Well, what if, what if I'm coming from this layout with Gary and me? If I come from this layout with Gary and me to camera one, I'm gonna have to turn off that upstream key. So now I have to build into that macro to turn off that upstream key. That's, that's kind of the core of that. Now, with that in mind, Let's talk about using it in a way that is gonna be very common, and that is gonna to be to save a preset like a picture in picture, to save a position for that. So you go through and you spend all this time designing the preset the way you want, designing the picture in picture the way that you want it. But you didn't have record macro turned on while you were doing that, because why would you? You were just messing around trying to get it right, but then you get it right and you go, okay, now I wanna save this. So how do I record a macro to save that position? There is no ability within the ATEM to just say, record this, memorize this position, that doesn't exist. And it's one of those things where you kind of go, well, why not? That would seem like it, there just should be, just you know, record the current state of the ATEM. Sure, however, there are thousands of lines of code to record the state of everything in your ATEM, from every input, every picture in picture, every possible border turned on and off, uh, the position of the board or the color of the board or the drop shadow. Which, there are literally thousands of lines of code to describe everything in the ATEM at any one given time. And so if every time you wanted to save the current state, you had a button that did that, it would create a massive, massive macro that would be wholly inefficient, take too long to run, and it's just it's not the way that it works. And so it doesn't exist. And you can argue up and down whether that should exist or shouldn't, but the fact is it doesn't. And so what you need to do then is think these through when you're building them. Okay, so back to the scenario where I've built a picture-in-picture -picture layout and I want to save this layout. How do I save that layout? The word that I use is tickle. You need to start recording a macro and then tickle everything that you want to be saved as part of it. So that means that if your box is here, and it's, you know, let's say it's, it's in a specific position, it's a specific size, and maybe it's got a specific crop. So now I go in and I tickle each one of those settings. So my size, I go, you know, x-axis, I go, I go one over, one back. Okay, that is just recorded that. Remember in the beginning when I told you that when you're recording it, it doesn't record the one over and the one back, it just records that final state. So if this is, if this is you know, position minus 1.3, and I go to minus 1.4 and back to minus 1.3, that is not going to make it go, oh, oh, in the, when you play back the macro, it's just gonna record that minus 1.3 position. So that's what I do is I go through and I tickle each one of those to save that position. Now, when you're doing this, when you're recording these and you get into some pretty big ones, you get into some pretty lengthy things and, and you maybe do like five different steps in there and then you realize you made a mistake somewhere along the line. You're like, oh great, now I gotta record the whole thing over again. You could, or you can actually edit the macro by going into the, bear with me here, into the XML. You actually go into the code and modify it. And I know that sounds nuts, but you can. It's, it takes a little getting used to, but once you get used to it, you start to understand how things move around a little bit more. But the real power of that is you can then copy and paste blocks of code from one macro into another. So you can create, there's a lot of ways you can go about doing this. You could create uh, very complex macros by recording a, a series of simple ones and then combining them together. And there's actually a way within the ATEM interface to just say combine these together, or you can go into the code and combine them together on your own. Yesterday when I was setting up for this show, I needed, let's see, what was it? I needed, um, was it a border, a shadow, something, something that I wanted to add, oh, it was a crop. 
I wanted to add a crop to a macro that was already built. So what I could do is go and start a whole new macro and just make changes to the crop, save that, and then go in and find those lines of code that are for crop and move them in. But in this case, what I did was I just scrolled through because I knew I had crops somewhere in my macros already. So I found a crop command and I copy and pasted the code from that other macro into the one that I was working on. And then boom, there we go. So those are the kind of overarching things to know about macros. So now let's get into actually doing one so you can see how they work and see how terrifying the XML looks. But you know, it's honestly, it's not that bad. Uh, okay, so with that said, let's see here. How am I gonna do this? I'm gonna do this on this ATEM. And yeah, we'll do a picture in picture. So I've got my ISO loaded up. Um, I'm going to, let's, let's start with a basic picture in picture. So I'm going to do, from the presets here, I'm going to turn it on and turn on one of these presets. So let's go to the program output. There we go. And turn it on and let's position it over in that corner. Okay, so there's a preset. Um, which one do I want to look at? <laughs> they're both on air. Both cameras are red because they're both technically on air right now. Um, I'm going to look at that one. So right now, um, I've got both cameras on air. I've got this picture in picture preset set up and I want to save that layout, that position, but not that position because that's a, wherever it is, there it is. It's kind of a crappy position. I want to save a better position. I want to make a bigger, whatever. So, all right, let's do it. So I'm going to go over to the Mac control. Um, I'll show you where I'm going to do it. You've already seen this, but I'm going to show you again where I'm going to do it. And then I'm going to switch it over to the program view so you can actually see me doing it. So this is collapse everything. This is an upstream key. So I see from here, it's key one, upstream key number one. I know it doesn't say upstream key, it just says next transition. Here it says DSK downstream key. It doesn't say upstream key here, just they are. It says key there. So, you know, that's the upstream keys. Anyway, so this key one is currently on air. And if I look in my upstream key settings, I can see that it is set to a DVE key. I can see that the fill source is that camera and the position and size is as so. All right, so this is what I'm going to adjust. Now let me go back to this view so you can actually see it. And I will start with the size. Let's make this a bit bigger here. And let's move this over to down there and move it over here this way. I'm, <laughs> everything I'm looking at is reversed, so I keep going the wrong way. Um, and let's put a mask on it. Let's do a little crop off of the left and right. So we'll make it kind of squarish. Is that, uh, yep, that's good. And off the right. Okay, we'll, pr we'll pretend we're building one for this standing position right here, okay? So I've got that and we get a like, little bit more in frame. There we go. And I'm gonna add a border to it. The border's already turned on, but let's make it, just to make it obvious, we're gonna make it blue and we're going to make it uh, bigger. Where's my outer width? Here we go, so I'll make that bigger. So just to kind of go back and show you what I'm working on here. This is, there's these controls. So I have this border control, I set the color. I got an outer width, inner width, I can soften it and I can do all kinds of fun things in here. So again, back to this. And I got that border on there. I can make it a little soft on the edge in there. Does that look good? That looks absolutely ridiculous. Excellent, I'm gonna go for a total junky look in here. And border opacity, you know, you can do all kinds of fun stuff. Okay, we're just gonna leave it like that. So there's my, there's my really clearly brilliantly designed Picture in picture. So now I want to save this. So remember, the key is to tickle everything. So to create macros, I guess I need to bring this back up. To create a macro, you go to the macros menu and you see the command is macros, command shift M on a Mac. So just select that and you get this macros palette in here. This is a little hard, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna move this down so you can see this palette a little cleaner. So on this macro palette, you have two tabs. You have a create tab and a run tab. Um, as you might have guessed, create is where you create your macros and run is where you run your macros. So under the create tab, you click on plus, it's going to grab the first empty slot or you can click on an empty slot and click plus and to, start re to start making that. When I click plus on here, it brings up and I can add a name, I could add notes to that and then I hit record. Let me cancel that for a second. The, if you have one that you want to edit, this edit button here, all that actually lets you do is edit the name and description, not to edit the actual macro itself. So when you see that, don't get too excited. Then this is the delete, to delete a macro. Um, this is the run button. So under the run button, you have two options. You've got this recall and run that can be turned on or off. So I can select a macro and then click play. Or if I hit recall and run, then as soon as I click a macro, it is going to run it. This little button here allows me to loop macros. So this was actually the very first ATEM mini tip that I did 
was how to auto switch camera angles. This is a question that comes up a surprising amount. I, find, I thought it was surprising, but um, I guess it's not. But, um, oh, my monitor is about to turn off. Give me a second here. I do not want this confidence monitor turning off or I will not be able to see that I am on air. Power off in one minute. No, don't do that. Where's my recording going? Excellent. Um, okay, so uh, the very first tip that I did was how to auto switch camera angles. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so the way that I did this through a macro, and I, I, we can do one of these later if you guys want to see it, I'll show you how, but it's quite simple. Effectively, I'm simply load a camera angle, build in a pause, like five second pause, and then load up another camera angle. And what I would, what I would do is do like, go to camera one, wait five seconds, go to camera three, wait six seconds, go to camera two, wait four seconds, kind of build a random pattern in there and then loop that macro. So you build it as random and as long as you want and then loop that and that way the cameras are constantly rotating and you can make it appear as random as you want, right? Or you can just do okay, five seconds on camera one, five seconds on two, five seconds on three. Or you can jumble them up, add different timings in, tween, in between so it feels random and make that as long as you want so nobody watching will detect the pattern and then loop it. So really easy to do, but that's where that loop can come in. So super handy to do that. Okay, so... We can do that later. If you guys want to see me do that, let me know, let Gary know, and I can do one, but it's, that's basically what you need to do. So let's do one for this picture in picture. So I'm back to the computer setup here, and I'm going to go into create, and I'm going to create a new one, and we're going to call this guy, um, what are we calling this? We're going to call this demo PIP, PIP, picture in picture, and then I'll go, this is a demo, wow. Okay, so now I've got my little description in here, yay. Hit record. Now, once I hit record, I'm gonna bring this up out of the way, you'll see that you get this red box around your interface just to kind of tell you, you are recording everything, you are being watched, everything you do is being recorded. I can also collapse this to get it out of the way. So that little button up there is just collapsing that to hide that out of the way. So I need to bring up the picture, I need to adjust my picture on picture. So let's go over here and let's start by adjusting the upstream key and tickling everything. Remember, I don't wanna actually change anything that's in here. I just want to save the state of what it is. So here's the first thing that might bite you. So I can go in here and I start making all these changes. But if I don't actively tell it to be on the DVE tab, then if I have done a chroma key, uh, an upstream key, let's say on the chroma, and then I run my macro to adjust the DVE, it's not going to switch over to DVE. And so it's not going to work. So everything, you got to think this through, everything that has to do with whatever you're trying to save needs to be tickled, needs to be touched so that it is written into the code. So I will first, I want it to be on DVE, so I'll switch to any other one, doesn't matter what, and then back to DVE. Now DVE is the last thing that I've touched up here, so that is what's written into the code. But now I click on Chrome, oop, that's now written into the code, oop, now it's overwritten, it's DVE. Okay, what fill source do I want? Make sure you choose your fill source or else it's going to choose whatever it uh, last was written into it. So in this case, I want it to be the 4K camera. So I'm going to switch it to the 6K and then back to the 4K. And that is now written in. Position, X, Y, size all need to be done. So the way I do it is I click into it and then I just use the up arrow on the keyboard and down. I just go up, down, up, down. That just writes that in. Up, down, up, down. It writes that in. Okay, mask. I want my mask on. So I have to make sure I tell it to go on. That means I have to turn it off and back on again. I don't want the crop, I don't want the top to be masked. We think, well, okay, then don't touch it, right? You don't want it to be masked. Oh, but do touch it. Because if you had done something before where the top was masked and you don't now tell it to go back to zero, it'll leave it where it was because you haven't told it to go to zero. So you need to tell it to go to zero. So again, go in here and up, down, bottom, up, down. It's a little tedious, but this is how it works. Left and right. Okay, shadow. I don't want a shadow. Well, then I better explicitly turn that off to make sure that it is off. Border, I do want a border, so I'll turn that on. Color, I want my color to be blue. Now here's a, a, a situation where maybe you don't want to write the color in. Maybe I want to choose a different color every time I do this. Well, I can choose that color manually before I run my macro, and if I don't right now explicitly choose a color, that's not written in, and so whatever color I choose before I run the macro, that'll be the color of the border. So you can kind of mix these up. You could even build macros to do different colors. So I could have a series of macros, red, blue, green. Those are setting the colors. And then another macro that puts my picture in picture in this layout that we just designed. So I could you know, load that color and then load that picture in picture. 
or reverse it. I could load that picture in picture and it happens to have been blue last and then I can tap the macros to change the colors and it's not going to move the picture in picture because that macro is only changing the colors. You start to see how the power can really kind of comes in here. It's really, really cool. So let's see here. So I'm going to change the color though. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll change the color. I'm going to click on that. Let's just like make it, um, make it back to blue, right? That's what I wanted. Okay. And, or I could go in here. I could do it this way as well. I can go hue up, down. It's probably a better way to do it. Saturation and luminance. Okay. So that's all written in. Style, there's nothing to choose there. So I do that. And then width, all these things all need to be tickled. So let me just go through these quickly. So up, down, click, up, down, click, up, down, click, up, down, and click, up, down. Anything else in here? This whole keyframe animate, this is a whole animation thing. Um, you can leave this alone. It's not going to automatically trigger an animation unless you explicitly tell it to. So don't worry about this stuff here. We're not going to get into this today. Uh, all right. So that is everything there. Now, can anybody think of what I'm missing from this command? I haven't told it to come to air. So I've designed the picture in picture. But nowhere in this command that I say, bring this picture in picture to air, which is fine. Maybe that's how you want it. Maybe you don't want the command to bring it to air. You just want the command, the macro to get it set up and ready to bring to air. But I want it to bring it to air. So I'm going to have to do that. So explicitly, I'm going to now go over here to my transition, next transition, or to, well, it's to the keys and turn it off and then bring it back on air. So now that is designed and brought on to air. Did I forget anything? I don't think so. So this will allow me to bring that picture in picture on air, no matter what is behind it, no matter what is set up in the program, because I have not, and I deliberately have not set the program. So with this macro, no matter what program is on, no matter what input is currently on air, I can bring in this picture in picture, which means I could even bring in the same video. What did I set into it? Uh, the 4K camera. The 4K camera could be in the background and loading this back, loading this macro will bring up that same 4K camera in the picture in picture. Okay. So with that said, let's go ahead and stop. By the way, this, if you're going to add a pause, like for the uh, auto switching, you click on add pause here and it does that. So we are done. We'll click the stop button to record and there we've got it. So demo picture in picture. So now let's mess it up. Later we're going to break it so that we are forcing it to be uh, loaded. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to break everything. I'm going to change the input to a different input. Actually, here, I'll just do this. I'll go in here and I'll sit reset all. Boom. And now everything's reset in here. Let's see here. Uh, or I'll, I'll even here. Let's change the color. I guess the reset doesn't change the border color. So let's do that. Change that. I'm going to get rid of the zoom thing so I can do this more quickly. All right. I'm just going to change everything here, break it all. And I think that's everything. Uh, let's turn this shadow. We know we want the shadow off. off so I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to Totally mess up the mask in here. Oh, actually, it's all set to zero, so that's good. We'll turn that off. So basically, everything now about this is wrong. And if I look at this on air, the <laughs> that's what it currently looks like because I really broke it. So if I turn that off, all right, so there it's on, um, and it's very, very broken. So I'm going to turn it off. And now to run this, I'm going to go to the Run tab. I'm going to turn on Recall and Run. So all I have to do is click this. So let me go back to this view. And then I will click it. Ready? Three, two, one, click. Ha <laughs> ha. Look, it worked. And there we go. And there's the picture in picture. So there's building a relatively simple macro. So now let's take a look at, let's say I made a mistake, right? I did all this and I go, I don't really don't like this border thing like this. Like just like, like dumb. Let's change it. I want to make a better border thing. So I'll play with it, right? I'm going to go back into my settings. And I'm going to do this. I'll leave this up on screen so you're not going to see my computer screen. And I'm going to, let's get rid of the softness. Okay, I just get rid of the softness and I'll just make the little bit less wide. Okay, so make that like, let's say right about there. Okay, so I've just changed two parameters. I changed the softness and I changed the width of that. If I go in here and I look at these, um, I look at the softness, outer soften I set to zero, so that's easy to remember. And the outer width I set to 0 0.61. Let's just copy that to the clipboard so I, or, or I could write it down or whatever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to manually change the code to reflect these changes that I want to make. That's one way of doing it. I could record a, well, I could start over, record a whole new macro, but that seems kind of silly. I could record a macro, actually we'll do this too. I'll record a macro just with those changes and then combine them. So I'll show you all the different ways that you could go about doing this. So let's go back over here. I'm going to create um, a new, let's go to the Create tab, and I'm going to create a, let's call this a, a PIP fix. And I'm going to say temp because I know 
the, I'm going to call it that so that I remember later this is not some important thing. I'm only using this temporarily. So I'll hit record, and then I can go to my width, and this tickle that. Up, down, up, down. Hello, where are we? Up, down. Okay, that is going. Where was I? 0.61. And then, uh, what did I say the soften? Was the outer or the inner soften? It was the outer soften. So let's go up and down. So now I've just tickled those two. Stop that. So now that PIP fix should only have the code for changing the outer width and the outer soften. All right, so now I need to combine these things. Actually, even before I combine them, let's just run them. So I'm going to run, let's go back to this view. I'm going to run the first one, the demo PIP, which is going to set it to that view. And then I'm going to run the fix. Ah, see, and it fixes it. Super. So now I know these two work. I just now got to put them together. Or remember, I know that the only two numbers I have to change are that outer to zero and that uh, border to 0.61. So just remember that, and we're going to see different ways we can go about changing it. All righty. Now let's go ahead and do the export. So we're going to save as, and it's going to bring up this window. Well, first it's going to ask me where. Um, don't, little tip here, don't save these to a cloud drive. I've had, it doesn't really make sense, but I've had issues with, especially the media. Um, I, I don't really understand why, but I've, I've had better consistency with saving them and finding the right ones later, saving them just to a not cloud drive, just saving them to the movies folder or whatever. I, I don't really have a good reason why. It just, it's, uh, for some reason, it just, I just trust me on this one. All right, so I'm gonna save this in my movies folder. Uh, oops, wrong button. Uh, home folder, where's home, where's movies? I actually have in here, uh, there we go, ATEM settings. See, I have a folder for ATEM settings in here. All right, we're gonna call this one, call this one class demo. And that's what the name of the XML file is going to be. Now, you notice here, if you look at my other XMLs, they all have a date and timestamp. That is added automatically. Super, super handy. That's very, very important to have. So name it just class demo, hit save. Now, what do I want to save? I can save everything on here, including the media. Remember, I talked about that earlier. But I don't need all of this. All I need are the macros. And the only reason, well, it's two reasons that I don't want to save everything if I don't need it. One, it takes longer to save. And it will take longer to load that file back in if it's a bigger file. Two, it's going to make it harder for me to find the lines of code that I'm looking for when I've got code for everything about this ATEM in one file. So all I care about right now are the macros, so I'm just going to save the macros. Incidentally, though, saving everything is a great way to do a backup of your current settings on your ATEM. So I do advise doing this every once in a while. All right, I'm going to hit select none and then enable just macros and save. You get a little status down here, 100% complete already, it's done, and we're good to go. So now I need to edit that. I am going to use an app on a Mac called BB Edit. BB Edit is, uh, there's, I'm using the free version. There is a paid version that gives you more control. The thing about BB Edit, as you're about to see, is when I load the code, it color codes things. It organizes it in a way that really makes it easy to see what I'm looking for. And it has this really cool feature where any block of text that I put the cursor on will automatically highlight other identical blocks of text. So it really makes it easy to find those random bits of code that you're looking for. Um, on Windows, I don't, I'm not a Windows user, so I don't know what there is, but there's obviously plenty of code writing. It's code writing app. There's plenty of apps like this on Windows. You can just open it in a plain old text editor, but then you're not going to get the color advantages that you're about to see here. And I think these are super helpful, especially for somebody who doesn't know anything about code. All right, so let's open in ATEM settings, and where's the one I just made? Class demo, there she is. So open that, and there she is. There's all this crazy code in there, right? It looks scary. But if you start to read it, it's not, I mean, okay, it's kind of weird, but it's not that bad. Uh, we are working with the macros. So see, it says macro pool. So that tells me that all my macro code is living in there. And then it says macro index equals zero. That is my first macro. So there's the name of it, switch to camera B, a description. I didn't write one. What the actual code is, it was changing the program input to camera two. That's all it was. And then end of macro. So beginning of macro, end of macro. That's all that macro is. By the way, I know it's index zero. This is a code thing. It's index zero, but it's position one. Position one. And then position two is index one. Just, just, I know. I know. It's like an old engineering thing, I know. Gary's laughing. It'll kill you, but you'll, you'll eventually remember. Anyway, so the one that I want to play with is down here somewhere. Uh, and that's your name, SS, name, demo, P, demo PIP. There it is. So there's my demo picture in picture. So now, so actually, can I just make this code, can I make this bigger? Uh, let me see if I can make this font bigger in here. I know there's a way. 
I know there's a way somewhere in here to make this bigger. Good grief. There are too many settings in here. Um, ba -ba -ba -bam. Te uh, text colors. Does that change the size? No. Uh, I just want to make this a little easier to see. No. You would think? No. Oh, well. Text colors seems like a logical place for it since it's all about the text, but I guess not. <sighs> Real quick, one more. Appearance. Oh, maybe it's just under appearance. List display font. So this is not going to be that, is it? No. Oh, well. All right, never mind. Sorry, we're just going to have to zoom into it. So, uh, actually, I wonder if I can zoom. Oh, I can do that. Zoom my whole screen in. Yeah, there we go. Found that keyboard shortcut. Okay, so demo PIP. So, this is a demo. Wow, this is the one. And we scroll down, and so you start to see all the different commands DVE and flying key exposition. So, that is the X position of that key, the Y position, the key size, and so on. All of that is here, and there's the number. There's things like uh, let's see here. Let's go for mask, uh, mask enable. Here we go. So mask enable, is that going to be turned on or off? So mask enable is true. If I wanted to turn off the mask, then I would just change that to false. So now I got to find the codes that I needed. What, uh, oh, I forgot what they were. What did I want? Border, border, uh, hue, no such luminous border, outer width. There we go. Outer width. You see it's at 1.92. I wanted it to be 0.6 something. Let's see here. I think it's on my clipboard. Yes, 0.61. So I just pasted that in. I wanted the outer softness. There's outer softness. I wanted that to be zero. So I'm going to change that to zero. If I scroll down a little farther in here, then you'll see that PIP fix that I did. So there's the fix, border outer width to 0.61 and border outer softness to zero. So I could simply take these two lines of code and let me zoom out of this a little bit now. Take these two lines of code and copy those and then go up and paste them in, paste them over the other codes in there. So I could do it that way or I can change it manually like I just did. So I just changed it manually. Awesome. Let's uh, we'll zoom back out. There we go. Now, big advice here, big tip. Don't just hit save because let's just say you changed a bunch of stuff and you broke something. Mm. You want to have the one that you just exported, which you know works because you literally just exported it. You want to keep that safe. So always, always, always do a save as. And here's my technique for handling this. Remember, they all have a date and timestamp automatically. So I'm going to go back to the Mac settings here and I'm going to go save as. And I'm going to change the name. I'm going to go to the last. I'm going to change the timestamp. So I'm going to delete these. Oh, great. I just hit the. Anyway, I'm going to delete the minutes and seconds. And it's currently 1318. So I'm going to go 18. And then I'm going to put my initials. Photo Joseph. There we go. So now I've just changed the name. Make sure I got the .xml in there since I deleted that. Um, I've changed the name to include the current time and then my initials. So this way, it's still sorted in order of creation. And it has my initials, so I know this is one that I actually created by hand. Cool. All right, now I save that. Close that. And now let's go back over to the ATEM. And let's now go in and restore. And get this out of the way. Mm -hmm. Restore. Make sure we got the right one. See, got the that's again the initials come in handy, right? That's the right timestamp. That's the right one. Hit restore. It asks what you want to restore. So if you did save out everything, but you only need to restore the macros, you could just enable that. Obviously, macros is the only thing in here. Hit restore. There's a little progress down here. It's already 100% complete, and now it is all set. So now let me mess this all up again. So let's go ahead and I'll change the wrong camera and I'll change the position. I'm not going to change everything. And I'll turn the mask off and turn the shadow on. Make the border. Uh, I don't know, make the border super big. Okay, so I made the super huge border. Right now, let's see what does it look like. Here's what I've created. There it is, clearly very, very broken. I'm now going to load that single demo PMP, the one I fixed, and boom, there it is, with the new border, with the clean, thinner border. So that's how that works. That's the core of creating macros and editing macros. So again, records only what you tell it to doesn't record what you don't tell it to. Easy to edit by exporting the XML and either modifying the lines of code by hand or recording a separate macro that has just the changes you need and then going in and rearranging them by hand to uh, put them all together the way you want. So that's, that's the core, the crux of using macros. Now the limitation of a macro, where are we on time? Oh yeah, we're great. The limitation of a macro is you can only control one piece of hardware at a time. So the macro can control your ATEM. Well, it can also control a connected a HyperDeck, but it can't control anything outside of that. It can't control another ATEM. 
it can't control, I don't know, your Mimo Live software that you're using to integrate in. It can't control your lights. It can't control your uh, web presenter that's live, you're using for live streaming. It can't control all, all of those things, but something else can. So that's gonna be the next part of this. So we're gonna pause for questions here. And then the last part of this event, we're gonna dive into the, um, into the really cool fun stuff we can do with a Stream Deck. So Mr. Gary, there we go. Yes, um, I was just going to offer a couple of observations here uh, as we don't have any questions. But the first thing is about text editors. Um, it's probably best not to use in Windows WordPad or Notepad because uh, sometimes the characters can get corrupt. Uh, they weren't designed to be clean text editors. Um, I use a, a VI type uh, program, but those are more probably programmer geeky types. So I'm, there's probably better ones in Windows. Uh, I like BB Edit a lot for the Mac. I don't use Text Edit in Mac because it also will corrupt um, some of the numbers sometimes. So if you inadvertently use it and you find out the macro doesn't work, it's probably just because it puts some hidden characters in that you don't want. Um, oh, that's right. Uh, somebody just, uh, Ben pointed out that you can use Notepad++ in Windows, and that indeed does work uh, okay. for text okay. editing the macro. So that is a good, a good answer. Does it do any of the color coding? I think um, I think it may. Uh, I, I've used it once. I've forgotten. Um, okay. Okay. Yes, it does. I'll show you because I, I didn't really show that much in BB Edit. Let me just show you a couple of the things about it. Not that I don't, I don't care if you use BB Edit or not, but just to show you why it's really useful. Um, so not only is it color coded, but let me zoom back into here a little bit. Um, but you'll see in here the indentations. And also there's a little triangle here to collapse things. So if I go up to the very top of this, I hold down the option key and I hit that, it collapses everything down. So now I can open, oops, hold the option key, there we not control. Now see, there's my whole macro pool, it's open that. And I go, okay, it was, uh, it was this PIP fix that I need to look at, so now I can open that. It's just very, very clean. It makes it really easy to find what you're looking for because you have this ability to collapse things and everything's indented nicely. And again, the color coding. And then I was talking about how it highlights the similar text blocks or identical text blocks. So here I click on this one, DVE key, border, outer width. Where is that in this text block? Well, there it is, it's already highlighted for me. And if I highlight a whole bunch of stuff, so I highlight this, it is going to underline that whole thing elsewhere. So it just makes it really easy to find your blocks of code. Just a little, just a little shout out for BB Edit. I think it's just brilliant the way it works for this. I have um, uh, one other observation or one little tip that might be useful, um, especially the, the example that you showed since it really only changed two things and you could actually run the first macro, then the second macro. With the macro system, you can actually record a third macro and then run the first one, then run the second one, and then close it. And now your new macro will be essentially uh, what you wanted in the first place. Because it, it, because it all happens at one time, it doesn't actually do the first thing and then the second thing. It does the last thing, just like it would be if you touched all the parameters. So that helps in a lot of cases. Not for every case, but in a lot of cases. Does it... I, interesting you said, and maybe I've, I've uh, gotten this wrong in the past, but so, okay, so in this one, I created the picture in picture and then I changed the border. But in that picture in picture, the first one, I did set the border a specific way. I've seen, I've had many cases where um, you see the macro takes longer than a single frame to run. And so you can actually see it build, but it's, you know, one frame at a time, boom, 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 and then it's built up. And so it seemed to me that if you, if you had that later command, that it would actually execute that first command to change the border this way and this way, and then later change it the other way. And if, okay, this one's so small that it would appear to all happen at once, but wouldn't that then actually be technically be happening later and you could end up seeing the, the change in there? That, that's exactly true. I mean, it all depends on if the parameter that you change um, actually takes a frame to execute. So there are some cases where that can happen and when you run it, you'll know. But generally, like the thing that you just did, you're really talking about changing the border and to from one parameter to another right right after itself and it can't do it both in the same time frame so um, so that would work but yes indeed there are some cases where things take more than a frame to execute in those cases then you have to be careful how you make them 
Right. And in, in those cases, the pauses can actually be very helpful. So I've got I've built some really complex macros before where um, you were seeing this kind of stuttering because it was taking more than a single frame to build the entire thing. And so by rearranging commands or building in delays at certain stages of it, you can make that not happen. Um, yeah, it's it's troubleshooting these Especially can be when you're complicated changing things but fun. like uh, super source inputs and DVE inputs. Remember the DVE and the super source are an extra frame, so it's going to take them a frame for them to change. So you have to be careful how you program all those uh, in macros. Right, loading the content of the DVE or the super source before actually loading the super source is the way to go. If you load the super source first, activate it first, and then make changes to it, you might on a single frame see the previous exist, uh, iteration of super source and then the next frame see the correct one. So changing that order can make all that better. That's it, we're up to date. Okay, all righty. So now let's get into the, thank you, Gary. Let's get into, um, into the, the Stream Deck and into Companion. So this is all third-party stuff. This is not Blackmagic uh, hardware or software, but it is third-party solutions that are designed to work with this. So let's start with, let's start with the physical box, the Stream Deck, the, high, uh, the Elgato Stream Deck. So this is, all this is, is a bunch of LED buttons. Each button has a little LED panel on it that can uh, do basically anything you want. The Elgato makes stuff primarily for live streamers, gamers. You know, you'd say that's kind of their primary market. And so these are really popular within the gaming community. And if you are using something like OBS, then there's a million different pre-built buttons to control OBS through a Stream Deck. This is the this is the biggest one here. The how many buttons? Is it? Tons of buttons. It's a big one. They actually make. Um, I have a little baby one that I have for when I travel and if I'm doing demos when I travel. A little tiny six button one is so cute. I love this guy. Oh, where's my over there? A little tiny, oops, uh -huh, see? Look there, see? I built a, a shortcut that did not include turning off the picture in picture. So now I have, to, I have another shortcut that I set up for this case, USK off, so that just shuts off all my upstream keys. Um, anyway, so there's, can you see that? Yeah, you see that little six button guy? So they have a little one here and then they've got the much bigger ones. Cool, okay. Um, put that away. So those, that is des designed to work with basically anybody who wants to write software for it. When you look at the Stream Deck software panel, it has a bunch of stuff that's included with it, but then there's a whole plugin marketplace and people can write plugins for it. One of those plugins is something called Companion. So Companion, think of Companion like a software layer that sits between your streaming hardware, all of this gunk, and the Stream Deck. It's just this software layer that sits between them. It, it executes commands from the Stream Deck. You build a button on the Stream Deck that you push, and it executes commands out to all the other hardware on there. Now, Companion, it's, it's a, like I said, third-party thing. It is open source. Anybody can write code for it. It's 100% free. And you can go up there to the Companion website and find modules for just about any IP-based hardware that has an open API that you can think of. So Blackmagic has open API on all of their stuff. So anybody can write code, third-party code, to control their hardware. It's wonderful. It's really, really cool. But it's not just Blackmagic stuff. I mean, well, let's just, let's take a look. Well, let's just, let's just take a look. Let me load it up here. And let me get the, so we go to the first, the, web, the website, the website. It's called bitfocus.io. Waiting for that to load. There we go. Um, cool. Okay, so bitfocus.io, that is the URL, bitfocus.io, Companion 2.2. This is their product. So if we look under uh, support list, then we're going to start to see all the things that are supported in here. So if I type in Blackmagic, you'll see that we can control. There's eight different modules. There's a module to control the hyperdeck module to control ATEMs, and that doesn't mean one ATEM, it's the entire suite of ATEMs, all of them can be controlled in here with this one module. Uh, the multi-view, which I don't have, uh, Terran X, that's for uh, uh, scaling footage, smart scopes, the smart view, the multi-view 4, and the video hub. So I own six Hyperdex, I have, a, well, you've already seen multiple ATEMs, and I have a video hub. So these three modules are insanely useful to me. Let's say, oh, actually, you know, there's something missing in here. Where's the web presenter? I know that's in here. 
Interesting. There is a web presenter module, but I don't know why it's not listed there. Anyway, then there's you know lots of Aja hardware in here. There's Barco projectors in here. Oh, right, my Behringer uh, X-Air audio mixer. So here you see Behringer Midas X32 uh, XR. Here we go. This is the one that I use. I use an XR16. I don't remember. Anyway, I've got a module for that so I can control my audio mixer from it. It's just a ton of stuff in here. So here's how it all works. So this is the interface. And you'll see that the UI is designed to look like the Stream Deck because this is basically they're meant to work hand in hand in here. And this is the page that I've been using. So let's look at a very simple one. So I talked about how macros can be written to you know, do all these things that you do. And, um, and if you don't write a macro to say, for example, when I switch to camera A to disable the upstream keys, then they're gonna be left on if they were already on. I can do things in here instead of writing macros, but I can't do everything in here that I can do in a macro. So what'll often end up, you end up doing is you start combining them. You build simple macros to do the things that this doesn't do. And then you use its, its GUI to do the things that you would normally do with a macro, but it's a little bit easier here because it's all a nice GUI interface. And you can control multiple hardware at once, but we'll come to that. So let's go in here to this A wide button. So that's camera A, it's my wide shot. And I look over here and it is a regular button and I've given it a name, A wide. And if I scroll down in here, let's see, I have to make this a little bit bigger, E kind of sort of. There is a command for the ATEM 2ME, that's this ATEM, set the program input on ME1. Remember, I, this is a 2ME, so I have two MEs in here, to my front wide camera. And then also upstream key, take it off air. That's key one, take that off air. Also take upstream key two, Oops, that's supposed to be two, ha, huh, genius. Let's take upstream key two and set that off air. So now both upstream keys are gonna be turned off if they were on. It's not gonna do anything if they weren't on. Incidentally, you have a toggle, so you could have it toggle if you wanted to, um, but I can just, I specifically want it to be off. And so now when I trigger that button, it is going to turn those off and turn on this input. That's a very, very simple level of this. But if we look over here at the connections, the connections, we see all the hardware that I do have on my network that is being that is being controlled or can be controlled by Companion. So there's, I have multiple ATEM modules for each one. So there's ATEM Mini Desk. That is actually a original ATEM Mini, one of the little ones that is mounted underneath my desk that allows me to take things that are on this desk that are outputting HD, like this is outputting HD feed that into that ATEM, switch which one I want, and then that fat passes into a 4K scaler, which then passes into my main ATEM. It's a bit ridiculous. Anyway, so there's that. Uh, there's Mimo Live, which is a software component that I use that can be controlled entirely through Companion. Insanely cool. There's the main ATEM, the ATEM 2ME. There's my XR, XR16, my Behringer switcher. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, audio mixer. Here's my Hyperdex. All six Hyperdex are in here. Uh, my Epifan Pearl, my Hue lights, although I, this, this never works right. It's supposed to work, but it just never works right for me. So it's all open source. So sometimes things don't really work, but for the most part, they work great. Uh, there's another ATEM. Some of these aren't, like that one's not online right now. This ATEM Mini ISO, that's the one that's right in front of me. There's the ATEM Extreme. There's my Video Hub, and then the Web Presenter. I don't know why that uh, missing, was missing in the search, but there's the Web Presenter 4K, which I can control from here as well. So all of these little pieces in here can be controlled. So how do I go about doing it? Let's make one from scratch. I'm gonna to go to a blank button here and let's build something that is going to execute over time. So I'm gonna make a regular button here and we're gonna call this A, B, C. So it's gonna go from camera A to B to C. All right, so this can be, these buttons can be uh, what's called a latch toggle or just a straight button. So when it's a latch toggle, when I press the button, like this right here is a latch toggle. When I press the button, it does one thing, latches, and then I press it again and it unlatches and it does something else. So buttons can have multiple statuses like that. We're just gonna do a simple one here. Where we're going to on press what I want it to do. If I click on this, it shows me a list of recent commands or I can just start typing in here. I can say, but you have to get the typing exactly right. So I guess like ATEM 2 ME. And then if I type the wrong thing here, suddenly there's no results found. So this can be kind of a tricky way to find them, but you can do it that way or they recently added this browse command, which makes it a lot easier to find things. So I know I wanna change the program. So program input, now what, what installed pieces have program on them? The ATEM mini desk has a program command, Mimo Live does not, ATEM 2ME does, ah, it's the 2ME that I wanna switch. So I'm gonna add that. All right, so let's click done. And now I say ME1, I want it to load to camera 
one, which is my front wide. And then let's do the same thing. And I'm going to do the exact same thing. So I'll just use my recently used. We're going to switch it to camera two, uh, front close. And then we're going to add another one. And where are we? Same thing here. And we'll go to camera. Let's go to the overhead. Now, right now, these are all going to execute all at once. I want to have a delay. I want time between these. I can, um, if I put a delay, say I put one second here, and then I put two seconds here, that two second clock and the one second clock start at the same time. Or I can do relative delays, which means that after this command executes, then this timer is going to start. So I'm going to say, is it in milliseconds? So we're going to say 2,000 milliseconds, that's two seconds, and then 2,000 milliseconds for the next one. So that's it. So I have one button that is going to switch from camera A to B to C with a two second delay between them. That's it. That's all there is to it. So now let's start with the, uh, I don't know, let's go to the shoulder view. Oh, by the way, I can trigger these by holding down the shift key. It kind of turns into a button state. And so now I can actually trigger it. So when I hit that, it's going to go to the shoulder view. And then I'm going to on my, let's do it like this. Let's go to the overhead view so I can show you triggering it. So I'm going to go here and um, ABC, there it is. So I'm going to hit it and it switches to camera one. And wait two seconds, switch to camera two, wait two seconds, and switch back to the overhead. And that is how that works. It's pretty cool. So from here, you can start to get into some really advanced combinations of things. So as an example, let's go back to this. I'm going to switch over to a different page. On, you can have up to 100 or 99 pages on your stream deck, by the way. I'm going to switch to page one, which is what I use for my main live show. And uh, actually, page two, sorry. And on page two, I have two very complex series in here, pre-show and show open. So pre-show, here's what this does. It runs a macro that turns off all my upstream keys, just to make sure that uh, they're all off. It sets the fader on my XR16 to uh, see for channel 9, which I guess is where my, dial my audio comes I don't remember. One of my mics comes in. Sets that to minus infinity, so silent. Um, it eff effectively, it is setting up the pre-show. It sets the preview to a specific camera. It sets um, a, now it sets one of the upstream keys on air. This basically sets the ATEM up exactly as I want it. It then integrates, let's keep scrolling, it integrates with MIMO and it brings up a, uh, a graphic and a countdown clock on MIMO. And it will start the countdown clock. It will switch my house music on. So my mic is off, my house music is on. And let's see, that's on, set to the right level. I mean, it's just a ton of stuff. Oh, it reroutes, oh yes, right. It reroutes through my video hub, the program into HyperDeck number five, because that's where I'm going to record the program. And oh, on the HyperDeck, it sets to, to record to SD slot number one. It sets the audio to two channel audio. And uh, let's see, what else is it doing here? It runs some, so this is a macro that at least when I first set this up, there must have not been a command to control the audio. I don't know exactly what it was doing, but controlling some audio level within my, uh, uh, within my ATEM. And let's see, that's it. So that is now ready to go. So at that point, when I run that, the show is ready to start. I've got my pre-show graphic. I've got the house music. My mic is off. There's a countdown clock going. So then I'm waiting for my countdown clock to end. And when it hits zero, then I hit the show start button. And the show start button does a, or show open, does a similarly ridiculous number of things. It sets a color into the background so that when it dips out, it dips to black. It sets the transition to a mix. It starts, uh, oh, it starts an animation. I got a whole video that plays through Mimo. Um, I just, you know, sets the mics the right way, turns off the house music and it fades out the mouse, house music, fades in my audio. I mean, even in here, if we've come farther down, it will start recording somewhere down here. It'll start with somewhere maybe I passed it. But anyway, it'll start recording on the HyperDeck. So it triggers recording on the HyperDeck. So I don't have to remember to hit record. It is automatically going to record when I hit the show start. And it's not going to record all the pre-show garbage. It only starts when I hit the button. So when I hit that button, it goes, uh, it fades out the house music, goes basically to black, starts recording, triggers off the sequence of events to go into the show. And then once the show, once it fades into me, so this is the animation that plays and it fades into me and the music fades out. Then after a few seconds or something that a lower third logo pops up, all of that controlled through a single button through a companion. So it's pretty crazy what you can do combining all these different pieces together. So that's a very you know, high level overview of what companion is, but that is the kind of the anchor that everything ties together in my system because it does allow me to have this immense amount of control over multiple pieces of hardware at once. It's, uh, 
It's pretty awesome. And it's free. Go figure. But you definitely want to buy a Stream Deck to go with it. You don't have to. Well, that is one of the other cool things about this. Um, you can. So over here, if I go to Web Buttons and I open this, it's just going to open a web browser with those same buttons on it. And there's actually, so this one's designed for a standard web page. There's another one, Mobile Buttons, New Web Mobile Buttons. Oh, I guess this is a more flexible one. Anyway, so it loads it up on a HTML page. So anywhere on the local network, even wirelessly, I can load that up. So I can copy that URL over to my iPad, and now I've got the same controls on my iPad. So what we'll off, I'll often end up doing is, so the Hyperdex, for example, it's kind of a pain to go in and reformat the disks in there. You have to go like a couple menu levels in, and cycle over, and it's like a, you know, multiple presses. And I've got six of them, and there's two drives in each Hyperdex, so it's a tedious process to do that. I have a shortcut that with two taps for safety, I, it's a uh, basically a get ready to format and then format taps using that latch toggle. And if I tap it to get ready and I wait, I think more than three seconds or something, then it cancels the operation. So it's a little safety thing that I built in. But I'll walk up with my iPad and stand there in front of the decks and I'll go, okay, format disk one. Okay, it's done. Format disk two, done. Way easier than navigating through the menus each time. Uh, stuff like that. Even recording. So when I record to the Hyperdeck from here, from Companion, uh, if I, okay, if I just walk up to the Hyperdeck and I hit record, I have zero control over the name of the file. It's basically like file one. I mean, it's something really, really generic on there. But from Companion, I can name it. It's named, you know, my live show. It's got a date and timestamp. A custom name is designed into it, and that's only written and triggered from here, and that gets written into the Hyperdeck. So, yeah, it's pretty awesome. It's really crazy what you can do with that. So that, that's that. That's what I wanted to talk about there. Um, if you have any questions about Companion, let me know. But I think I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap this. We've got you know 18 minutes left technically, but if you've got questions, bring them on. We'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. Gary, you're welcome to talk about whatever you want to talk about. But uh, yeah, let's bring this thing home. Yeah, I don't think there are any questions pending at the at the moment. All right. Oh, your video has frozen. Oh, both your videos are frozen. That's weird. Oh, there you're you're back again. How very strange. Anyway, uh, no questions. Well, come on, folks. You got some time. What do you want to see? I'll. Demo all rip things apart. Oh, you want to see what this whole setup looks like? I'm going to grab this camera off while, while we're thinking. Well, you guys are thinking of last minute questions. I'm going to grab a wide view here and show you what this whole system actually looks like because it's just fun. Make sure I'm not going to yank anything off the table by doing this. No questions? Come on. Somebody's got to have some questions. Somebody's got to have questions. I like questions. Does this have a battery in it? I gotta unplug the power. It does. Okay, I'm gonna unplug the power port. Let's see, does it seamlessly transition over to battery? Yes, it does. Excellent. All right. Um, can focus. Let's put that on manual focus. There we go. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Let me go to the program out. Yeah, and turn off. See, look at that. Upstream keys. Don't have it turned off there. There we go. Oh, let's get rid of that other upstream key. All right. There's a clean view. All right. So this is where I'm standing. You can see the ATEM in front of me here. So over here, I've got two monitors. Um, this one is showing the status of the web presenter so that I know the status of my live stream. Up here are my slides. So the slides are actually running on a computer over there in the rack. But this is on a wireless monitor, and this is just showing me my you know, previous next slide, so I can see that, which I'm controlling with a trackpad here. There's an iPad there, although I didn't really use that in this show, but that is plugged into the input on here. Then on this side, you've got my laptop that you've seen me interacting with. There's the Stream Deck and the, uh, the lifts meter up there, so you can see, let me get a real close-up view of this now that I'm here. Uh, focus on there, there we go. So you can see how it is Monitor it is uh, giving me a real time peak, so I can see exactly where my dialogue is in real time. But then the lift meter is showing me over this radar view where kind of a rolling 10 second, sliding 10 second average is, and so I know where my audio is, and I know if I'm too loud or too quiet or whatever. Super, super awesome, useful tool. So there is a big multi view of my main show. So that is coming off the main ATEM, and if I load, I can't do this right now. But if I loaded up the multi view from here of this ATEM, I would see that up there. But of course, you would just see the multi-view. And then over here, okay, now we're getting kind of far away, but I've got 
couple monitors there. That bottom one is the confidence monitor. So the, the cameras are right there under the big light. The confidence monitor there shows me what is currently on air, which, you know, you'd think I've got one here. I've got this one here. How many do you need? But man, having that one there is so useful because I can just, it's right in my field of vision when I'm talking to the cameras. I know exactly what's on air. That's Gary up there. That is actually mirrored from a computer that is in my office over there. And uh, that's just a Skype view. So he's hearing me through Skype. Um, and so that just allows me to see him in there. And uh, yeah, well, then that's a whole rack full of gear. We don't need to go into that. That's kind of ridiculous. But yeah, there you go. That's how all that works. Cool. All right, Gary, did we get any questions? Uh, yes, a couple of things. Um, what do companion variables do? Companion variables. Um, let me look and see what it is you mean. Companion variables. Companion variables. Where are the variables? I'm not sure what you're referring to. I'm looking, I don't see variable. Oh, 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 there. Var oh, oh, right. I never use these. Um, let me think this real quick. I think they're basically like presets. Um, yeah, the variables up here. I, I know I'm honestly not sure. I kind of know because there's a whole separate presets thing. I never use the presets. Uh, oops, presets, variables. I don't honestly know. Sorry. Let's see. Let me just try loading one. Let's see what happens. I go to variables, burn director. Oh, okay. I think this is just a list of all the possible commands. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, sorry. I got it. Now I know what it is. Now I know what it is. Let me show... Let's see. Where's one that actually I have set up to change the status? Um, it will sh it will update to show you the, the status of something. Okay, so this is the status of my web presenter. If I go to this button here, here's a great example. Okay, this one here, it says streaming medium. This is a variable. So the little dollar sign means variable. So here I have a variable that the title of this button is the Web Presenter 4K, that's that hardware, what its quality is. So it says streaming medium. These buttons here that I've made will trigger, will change it, change the status. So this one will change it to streaming low, this one changes to medium, that one changes it to high. When I click on one of these, it tells me here what the active status is. So the variable is reading the status of the hardware and feeding it back as a name. Another example of where I have that is audio. Let me go back to, where is that audio page? Um, doo -doo -doo. Where is it? Somewhere in here. I have a page of audio stuff. Darn it. It's not there. Where is it? And I can see the status. Of, oh, actually. Um, no. Anyway, I can see the status of certain things. I don't even know where it is. Clearly, I don't use it very often. But anyway, I have a lot of, I have some buttons that are variables built off of the status of the X air. And so, for example, you could have a volume adjust, you know, fader adjust up and down, and it will actually show you the position of the fader as a number in that name. So that's what the variables are. Sorry, it took me a while there. It's been a long time since I've built those. But there you go. There's your answer. So I have um, uh, another thing to talk about. And I'm sorry, it seems like my response delay is quite huge for some reason. But oh, okay. um, in any event, um, the question was about SDI camera control. And I wanted to offer the the, the concept that basically um, all of our ATEMs um, are in two groups. We have HDMI-based ATEMs and we have SDI-based ATEMs. And we have HDMI-based cameras and we have SDI-based cameras. And it's possible for any of the ATEMs to control any of the cameras. Um, however, the, 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 if you're going to cross over from an SDI-based ATEM to an HDMI-based camera, you need to use our microconverter bidirectional 12G or 3G so that we can provide camera control SDI-wise and HDMI-wise between the devices. And that's true the other way around, too, if you have an HDMI-based ATEM like a Mini and you want to control one of the SDI-based cameras, you need the microconverter 12G or uh, bidirectional 12G or 3G so that we can convert the signals back and forth and carry the camera control and the tally um, uh, uh, in both directions. So basically, if you just think about it, uh, it's possible to do. It might be a little more complicated than just writing it down on a piece of paper, but um, any of our ATEMs, SDI-based or HDMI-based, can control any of our cameras, um, SDI or HDMI-based. Awesome. 
I have a feeling that we are just massively out of sync right now, but, um, but the dialer is coming through and that's what matters the most. So <laughs> cool, thank you very much. Um, all right, uh, were there any other questions that came in? No. No, we have a really long delay. <laughs> all that wait just to hear no. All right. In that case, folks, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap this thing up. Thank you very much, Gary. I appreciate your help today. We are, uh, yeah, we're going to call it a day. I hope you guys enjoyed that. That was, that was a lot of stuff crammed into a short session. Um, although four hours doesn't seem that short, but it is when you see just how much stuff there is to cover. There's, uh, there's huge. I mean, this is just massively deep. There's so much you can do with this, especially when you start integrating all the different pieces together. And it does get really fun. It's, as you can tell from my own studio setup here, um, it has gotten a little bit out of control, but it is a lot of fun to do this stuff and just start integrating all these different pieces, combining it together with software like Companion, but bringing in all the different hardware, making them all talk to each other is just loads of fun. It gets a little bit more complicated the more you add, you know, more prone to mistakes, but that's where you just start with a little guy like this and build your way up from there. So uh, that said, I hope you all had a good time today. If you think of any other questions afterwards, don't forget Gary did hand out his email address in the beginning and uh, so you guys know how to reach him. You can also feel free to hit me up on social media at Photo Joseph or of course comment in any of my YouTube videos. Hopefully you all have subscribed to my YouTube channel by now. Um, I didn't see that number go up, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that you were all already subscribed because that number hasn't gone up. But if you aren't yet subscribed, then please do. I certainly appreciate that. And again, I do have a lot of ATEM videos and there are all kinds of other stuff as well. I guess that's pretty much it. I think we're gonna, oh, I, this video will be available. Again, I'm gonna leave the URL up so you can go watch it, the actual live stream at any time. Within a couple of weeks, um, I will release the, um, you know, not edited version, but you know, cut out the lunchtime break and that sort of thing and re-upload it in higher quality. So yeah, that's that. All right, folks, that's it. We're out of here. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. I don't have an end show button. Genius. Totally forgot to start and do an end show. I guess we'll do... Oh, wait. No, we have a thanks for coming. There it is. Okay, bye.